<laughs> oh, Cindy, right? Yes. Okay. We're now going on the record. The time is approximately 10 and 4 a.m. The date is September 22nd, 2014. We're here at 1900 Corporate Boulevard Northwest, Suite 215 in Denver, Tone, Florida. For purposes of taking a videotape deposition of Elliot Bernstein regarding the estate of Simon L. Bernstein. Hi, good morning. Yes. The estate Hi, of Shirley Bernstein. <coughs> Reporting services are being provided good. by U.S. Legal Support Hello? and videos provided by Amy and Dane. Please announce your appearance. Those who are here with you and then the reporter will swear in the way. Alan Rose, on behalf of Ted S. Bernstein, as a trustee, along with Ted Bernstein and his wife. I think on the phone is John Morrissey may want to make your own appearance. Yes, John Morrissey. Here on behalf of uh, Michael Bernstein, Eric Bernstein, Alexander Bernstein, and Molly Sun. Okay. Sir, so would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Do you understand what the purpose of this deposition is, sir? Well, before I start, I want to clarify some things under Rule 1.310 and just get things that were following all the right protocol. Is that okay? No. Okay. What are you objecting to? I'm asking you questions. Well, not yet. I'd like to clarify that everything's proper under Rule 1.1310. Are you refusing to? It's simple questions. Okay. Um, you're conducting the deposition and you're conducting it on behalf of the estate? Is this of Simon? You? I'm just asking to get it clarified who we're conducting this for. Did you receive a copy of the notice of deposition? I believe so, but you know, okay. I've been under the weather. Do you not want to do your deposition today? Oh, no, I absolutely do. because there's a second order compelling deposition of Elliot Bernstein. I'm not going to mark it in the exhibit, but it's in the court file. And thereafter, we have two properly noticed notices of taking deposition for today in this suite. That's what we're doing. Okay, my question was, who are you conducting it for? The estate of Simon Bernstein? This, since you're rep not represented by counsel, it's a simple question. You just gave me all that. Who's, who, is, who are you conducting this deposition on behalf of the estate of Simon Bernstein? Since you're not represented by counsel, theoretically, a, a counsel might even be able to ask these questions, but I don't believe he could. Um, well, I'm, just I'm here as counsel for the. You did for Don Tesher's deposition, where he clarified things before we started the deposition. So I'm just clarifying under 1.1310 some of the things. So who's conducting the deposition? You are on behalf of who? It's a simple question. Okay. Next question. Okay, so you're not answering that. Okay, who's paying for the deposition? Next question. You're not going to answer that? Uh, are you? Just, okay. This is not my deposition. Okay, that's fine. I get it, but you are conducting the deposition, and as an officer of the court, I remind you that this is supposed to be fair, and everything's supposed to be up above board according to the rules. Um, Alan, um, in a hearing before Judge Colin regarding this deposition on September 15th and September 18th, you were informed by the judge that you're a respondent in the estate of Simon, is that correct? And Shirley. Okay. Are you, are you a respondent? This is, I'm asking questions. No, I'm getting things, I'm allowed to ask questions before we start to clarify the integrity of this Sir. deposition and if it's being conducted under bad faith. So, my question is simple. Are you a respondent in the Shirley and Simon estate cases? Sir. Were you informed this, by this, Judge Colin? There's an order about? compelling your deposition. I'm going to take my deposition. I just want to clarify the rules. I have every right to do that. And my counsel would be doing it. And as I'm acting pro se, I have these rights well, to I, ensure that this is a fair legal deposition being conducted without harassment, aggressive tactics, forceful tactics, those kind of things and that it's in good faith. So, are you a respondent in the estates of Simon and Shirley's cases? 
Have you been served petitions with your name as a respondent? Just make your speech and then we'll do your deposition. I'm asking a question. Okay. Next question. So you're refusing to answer that question. Okay, just for the record. Uh, note that for the record he's refused all questions pretty much so far. Um, you're a respondent both personally and professionally according to Judge Colin, is that correct? Okay, you're refusing to answer that. Have you accepted service for two counter complaints in related matters to, these, to the states of Simon and Shirley that you're named a counter defendant in? Is that correct? Alan? Alan, are you awake? Is he sleeping? Hello? Let okay. the record stand that he's refusing to answer. State okay, but name. go ahead. State your name for the record, sir. So, well, I would like to finish clarifying these questions, which will show if this conduct this deposition is being conducted in good faith if you're acting under all the rules of the Florida Bar and statutes properly. So you're refusing to answer. We'll get to my questions in a minute. I'm more than happy to answer anything you got. Uh, John, do you see any reason I shouldn't terminate the deposition? Uh, so far, I'm confused as to whose deposition it is, and I've objected twice for the record. Um, this is the, uh, my understanding is this is the deposition of Elliot Bernstein. Uh, Alan, you have every right to go ahead and answer and, and, and ask your questions. Uh, uh, so far, that is, Elliot's, uh, Elliot's attempted to block that. Uh, and so, you no, know, I, I see no reason if this continues to, to, to um, terminate the deposition. I'm going to ask you this, my own counsel, questions to clarify the record that this deposition is being conducted in good faith under Rule 1.1310. And let the record show that Mr. Rose, who's conducting the deposition, is refusing to answer the questions. Um, do you have counsel today representing you, Alan, okay. as a respondent and a, and a counter defendant? There's a hearing. There's a hearing that's set for this Thursday, this Wednesday. That apparently you would like to go forward. The judge has ordered that I get to take your deposition before that hearing. If you do not. I'm allow me to ask the deposition, but I'm, a, I'm allowed to clarify for the record that we're following the rules of professional conduct. You, you are an attorney, correct, under the Florida Bar? Okay. So, so let me ask, oh, do you want to start? Let's start. I think I'm ready. Sure. Since you're refusing to answer any questions. Okay. State your name for the record. Elliot Ivan Bernstein. You know why we're here today? To take my deposition. Do you know what matter we're taking your deposition on? I, I tried to clarify that, whatever, but no, not exactly. Whatever. Oh, oh, I think Judge Colon stated that um, we were here only to answer questions regarding the upcoming hearing to remove Theodore Stewart Bernstein as a fiduciary in the estates and trust of Simon and Shirley, which will be the hearing that's being held on 924, which this deposition was ordered for. And I believe in our eight, the September 18th hearing, he stated that it would only be limited to questions regarding Ted's removal. Are you seeking to remove Ted Bernstein from any roles he's serving as a fiduciary? Yes. And what roles are you seeking to remove him from? Uh, the PR of the estate of Shirley, the trustee, the alleged uh, successor trustee of Shirley's trust and the alleged Successor trustee of Simon's Trust. Why do you say uh, alleged? Well, as you know, there's been a lot of documents that have been frauded in this matter already by former fiduciaries and Ted's former counsels, Robert Spleen and Donald Tesher and their uh, employees, which have caused the dispositive documents to come into question. Also, some of the documents have been found to be improperly notarized by the governor's office. And the whole set of documents is in question with the courts and has been presented to uh, state and federal investigators. And I remind you, you're a respondent in all that too as well. I mean, you've been named in all those things, Mr. Rose. Okay. Move to strike comment. Um, is Ted the personal rep the successor personal representative of the estate of Shirley Bernstein? Uh, at this time, he was appointed by Judge Colon. 
You seek to remove Ted from that role. Correct. Okay. On what grounds? Uh, breaches of fiduciary duty, which I've sued him for in the counter complaints I file. Um, fraud. Um, a whole bunch of grounds in my petitions. Uh, if you need more than that. Conflicts of interest, adverse interests. Basically, the entire uh, violation of the entire trust and probate codes. And again, I allege that those documents that we haven't seen any originals and we've been secreted so many documents in this case already, as you know, we have no ability to show if Ted is those things. I've never received letters from Ted even after Judge Colin appointed him. I've never received compliance with the probate rules about uh, tendering documents and all the codicils, attachments, schedules, etc. That, uh, that a PR is supposed to provide beneficiaries. So I believe Ted's just alleging he's uh, things when he's not qualified and the judge might have made a mistake in appointing him before knowing that the documents had been tampered with, etc. What are the grounds you're seeking to remove Ted as successor trustee of the Shirley Bernstein Trust? Same grounds. How about for the Simon Bernstein Trust? Same grounds. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. And that, well, and I'm also suggesting that in the language of the Simon and Shirley Trust, he's prohibited by the language that he's operating under, by the language of the trusts. What language in the trust? Uh, language regarding successor trustee and the language that considers him predeceased for all purposes of the trust and distribution or dispositions, distributions, etc. There under. Are you aware that he's named by your mother in her trust to be the successor trustee after your father passed away? No. I am not aware of that because the documents, the trusts, have been secreted from us. We haven't been able to see the full documents. We've requested them repeatedly from the fiduciaries. And there's been evidence of forgery and fraud, admitted fraudulently altering documents by Ted's former counsel, Tesher and Spolina, to change beneficiaries, um, admissions to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office investigators, that they have fraudulently altered a trust document and disseminated it. I believe via mail and wire. Have you ever seen any part of a trust signed by Shirley Bernstein that actually names Ted as the successor trustee? I've seen copies of documents. I've requested to see the originals, but I've been denied by the fiduciaries for over two years now. Um, due to the evidence of fraud and whatnot, I can't tell about these copies. In fact, as you know, Alan, six documents were found forged in my mother's estate by Ted's close personal friend, Kimberly Moran. Um, and, you know, we, we are challenging all of the documents at this point. We're being refused to be turned over those documents by Ted. So I can't really attest to any of these documents as being valid yet. Do you remember my question was? Yeah, have I ever seen copies of a trust naming Shirley or Ted as successor? Yeah. Yes or no, have you ever seen a piece of paper that comes from a Shirley Bernstein trust agreement and names Ted as her successor? I cannot say that that copy is valid. I have seen a copy that states that. Like I said, okay. there have been forged and fraudulent copies already discovered in the estates and trusts of Cy and Shirley. Tell me about every document that you claim was forged and frauded in this case. Okay, there's six uh, waivers that were uh, admitted forged. Just give me a list first and then we'll talk about it. Six them. waivers um, and a surely uh, amendment to a trust. Okay. Now, what other documents do you have knowledge of that have been, that are fraudulent or forged or fabricated or whatever word you want to use? 
Well, none that I have proof on yet, but I've challenged the documents to the court for improper notarizations, improper constructions, et cetera. Okay. So I, let me see if I have this straight. You have been talking for an extended period of time in the court about a num all these documents that have been forged or that constitute fraud, and the only ones you're certain of, as you sit here today, are the six waivers and the Shirley Bernstein First Amendment that Mr. Spolina apparently created and has never been filed in court. Is that accurate? I don't know. Is it? Okay. You said that. Um, okay. Say it again. The, uh, you've been talking for an extended period of time about a massive fr amount of fraud that has taken place and documents that have been forged and the entire list of documents that you believe as you sit here today you have proof have been forged or fabricated are the six waivers and an amendment to the Shirley Bernstein Trust. Is Those that seven documents and then we have that the Simon 2012 amended and restated trust is improperly notarized. That's confirmed by Governor Rick Scott's Notary Public Division and the 2012 will of Simon is improperly notarized according to their offices. Any other documents that are? Well, we believe most of the documents, dispositive documents, have been altered and they are under investigation. What state and federal authorities are, are investigating this? Uh, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department, um, the uh, Illinois Federal Court, uh, where Ted has filed a breach of contract lawsuit against a life insurance carrier. Uh, alleging he's a trustee of a lost trust he doesn't possess. Um, and what was the question one more time? So can, what state and federal authorities are investigating these okay, um, documents? I went to the uh, Illinois, I'm trying to think of the name of the town. It's wherever Heritage Union Life is in Illinois. Uh, their police department I uh, contacted and have the case number. I've provided all those in my pleadings. Um, and they referred me to the FBI and I've contacted them because I believe it involves interstate mail and wire fraud and insurance fraud and fraud on an institutional trust company. So they referred it, kicked it up there, and I'm waiting for you know, their response. Okay. Let's talk about the six. Well, I've also uh, notified these courts here, uh, the court of Martin Colin and Judge French when he was involved of the frauds. Um, Let's see, is there anybody else? Uh, I believe we might have contacted the uh, Boca Raton Police. I'm not sure where that went yet. Uh, regarding some of the other thefts that have occurred that we are alleging. Uh, and missing furniture that we'll get to shortly. Do you blame any of the thefts on Ted? I do. And what? In what way was it Ted's responsibility or fault that there were Well, for example, the furniture in my mother's condominium was an asset of my father's estate. Uh, Ted and you told the court that the furniture in my mom's condo had been moved to the St. Andrew's home. And the court ordered a reinspection of that um, furniture, as I'm sure you know, two months ago roughly, that you failed to comply with. Um, and then in Don Tesher's deposition, we learned that you, both you, Alan, and Don claim that the furniture had been sold by Ted when he sold the condo, where I don't think Ted was ever the PR of Simon's estate. I think that was Tesher and Spelina. And then when they got booted, it was, uh, it was uh, Ben Brown and then uh, Brian O'Connell now as the PR. Ben was the curator, and uh, the, those, the furniture of Shirley's was listed as an asset on Simon's estate, so if Ted sold it, we don't know how he sold it, who he sold it to, it's still listed as an asset on the estate of Simon's inventory, I think he got the final accounting and all the objections from the curator and whatnot, which show that that property is now missing. Also, I believe the creditors informed others that... Uh, the furniture might be missing and is missing, according to Don Tesher's statement, sold by Ted. 
So there appears to be no accounting, and therefore I would allege that that's a theft of personal properties of Simon that nobody was notified about, and there's no record of. There's also jewelry. I've reported that to the Palm Beach County Sheriff. You can get a copy of the report. I think I provided it to the courts, so you should have a record of it. Do you recognize that the personal representatives of Simon's estate would have the right to sell the furniture that's owned by Simon wherever located? The personal representatives of Simon's estate would, yes. Okay. Are you suggesting they sold it? I mean, they, that they sold it? Now, the six waivers that you mentioned, would you agree with me that there are actually 12 waivers in total that no. are relevant to the estate of Shirley Bernstein? No. Nope. Would you agree with me that the waivers only relate to the estate of Shirley Bernstein? Um, no, I, I don't agree with that in total. I, I believe they were used in Shirley, but they had uh, relation to the estates of Simon Shirley. But what relation do the waivers have to the estate of Simon Bernstein? Well, for example, one waiver was submitted by Simon after he was dead, and it was forged after he was dead. So these are post-mortem forgeries of a decedent in these cases, used supposedly by Simon, and you'll recall in the September 13th hearing before Judge Cullen when he found out that my father had closed his estate while dead, he, I believe, issued Miranda warnings to Ted and, or stated he had enough to issue Miranda warnings at that moment to both uh, Theodore Bernstein and his counsel, Robert Spolina, who was also counsel to the estate at the time. I think he said he was going to read them their Mirandas twice in that hearing for two separate things. One for finding out the waivers were forged, and then the second that Cy was used while dead to close the estate of Shirley at a time when Ted was alleging to be the PR of the estate, who should have properly closed it, but nobody notified the court. That's also in the court's September 13th transcript. Now. Do you believe that your father signed a waiver while he was alive? I don't know. I've never seen an original document. I've asked for it several times. I'm not sure if it's been turned over to the Palm Beach County Sheriff yet. Well, that wasn't my question. My question was, do you believe that your father signed a waiver while he was alive? I don't. Did you sign a waiver while your father was alive? I did. Do you believe that your four siblings signed waivers while your father was alive? No. In fact, Jill didn't sign hers till after my father was dead, even though it was presented with another document of my father's supposedly signed April 9th of 2012, whereby my father said he had all the waivers in his petition for discharge, I believe, or one of those documents, a waiver of something. But Jill hadn't sent her waiver until after my father had died, I believe, on October 2nd, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not looking at the document. Do you believe that Ted, Pam, and do you believe Ted and Pam signed waivers while your father was alive? I don't know. You'd have have you read that. their affidavits? Uh, I believe so. Okay. They say they've signed them while your father was alive, don't they? They also said that but my that, father's yes, signature sir. was my father's but now it turns out it was forged, so their, their statements seem a little bit like they were caught in the act and then wrote some affidavits to try to cover their ass. But okay, what, yeah, you know, I, whatever they say. Well, no, I'm not asking whatever they say. Did you read their affidavits yeah. where they said that they had signed the documents on the date that they dated them, the original waivers? On Ted, Pam, and who? 
Well, I said Ted and Pam. Oh, Ted and Pam, uh, yeah, I believe that's what they state in their affidavit. How about Lisa Friedstein? Did she sign a waiver while your father was alive? Oh, I believe she said she did in her affidavit. Who's Lisa Friedstein? My sister. When's the last time you spoke to her? Um, a few months ago. Okay. And do you have a good relationship with Lisa? I do. She's supportive of you and believe you should be doing the things you're doing in this estate? I don't, I have no idea. Okay. And your sister Jill I and Tony signed a waiver on October 1st after your father had passed away. Is that correct? Correct. That date you're certain of, right? Because it's, it, it's helpful to you. What date? October 1st. Okay, yeah. That's the date I believe she signed it. Okay. Because that's what it says on that document you just turned over. October so 1st or 2nd? October. I'll show it to you if you'd like. Yeah, would you? Does that say October 1st? That says October 1st. So that's okay. that's you, two weeks, three weeks after my father died. Your original question was, did they all sign him while he was alive? So that would prove that Jill at least did. Right. And just so you know, in, in fairness, sometimes I ask bad questions. It's not always intentional. If we're here searching for the truth. We're here together in a, in a process that is what the courts exist to search somewhat for the truth and somewhat to search for resolutions and for answers. Um, but I asked a bad question earlier, and uh, I appreciate you correcting Which me. question did you ask that was bad? I said, did your four siblings sign while your father was alive? And that was a bad question. So let me ask you a different question. Would you agree with me that Ted S. Bernstein has filed a petition to reclose the estate of Shirley Bernstein? He's filed it. You've seen it. I've seen that, okay. yeah. And there's exhibits attached to that document which you've seen, correct? Correct. And you get a lot of papers in the case, but you, you spend a lot of time reviewing them, don't you? I do. Okay. This, this is a serious and important matter for you. Yeah, it involves the death of my parents, a possible murder, according to Ted, of my father, which he reported to the police and coroner that he had been poisoned. Um, so yeah, this is some pretty serious stuff, I would say, Alan. Okay. I do take you, it real serious. Do you believe your father was murdered? I, do I believe my father was murdered? I'm starting to with all the forgeries and fraud and everything going on here, yeah. How many forgeries and fraud did you <clears throat> strike that? You've only identified two forgeries and fraud, the six waivers and the Shirley Amendment, correct? Seven documents at this point, yes, and I okay. notified that you that the wills and trusts were well, deemed improperly notarized so that it couldn't be told that my father was present at the signing. I would say these are, you know, all serious, serious document problems, whatever you want to call them. Okay. Now, attached to the petition to reclose are six waivers, one by Simon, one by you, one by Ted, one by Pam, one by Lisa, one by Jill. Have you seen those pieces of paper? The ones that were rejected by the court? Yes, the ones that were rejected by the court. Yes. Okay. And those all were filed in the courthouse and bear stamps that they were filed on October 24, 2012 at 1.31 p.m. By my father, who was dead at the time. Well, no one's saying your father filed it, sir. <laughs> Did Ted file those as, now, as PR? You've seen these six waivers, correct? I have. Okay. And there's six other waivers that were fabricated, correct? Uh, there's 12, I believe. Well, there's six waivers that... There's six that were rejected. That were rejected. There were six, six that, that were, were forged. And then there's six more they're trying to insert with their new documents. Who has... That they signed on September 13th, the day of the hearing where... Presentation now to me. There are affidavits of your siblings, but the affidavits do not attach new waivers. They just attach copies of their prior waivers. Oh, I thought they had done new waivers on September 1st. Would you like to look at them to confirm which, that? Which they waivers did they have? No. Which so waivers did they have? Uh, practice experience, which include. including my father. Okay. Well, the record will reflect what I said. Oh, okay. Here's the affidavit okay. of Lisa S. Friedstein. It's 
it doesn't need to be marked because it's already in the court file as Exhibit D to the petition to reclose. So, have you seen the affidavit that your sister Lisa filed? Yes. And attached to the affidavit is that a new waiver form or is that a copy of the original waiver form that was yeah, already filed? Yeah, this is a copy court? of the one that's rejected. It's still not notarized. Okay. So. So why would you be filing an unnotarized waiver when the court requires notarized waivers? So would you agree with me that there's only 12 waiver forms that have been signed? Six yes. legitimate yep. and six fabricated. Uh, yes. And do you have any facts to support a belief that your father did not actually sign his waiver form well, I have on, on April 9th, 2012? Yeah, I believe that the, the April 9th documents you're looking at, can I see that real quick? Yeah, I believe that this document was part of fabricated documents. So it's, it's your belief that your father did not, in fact, sign this document on April 9, 2012? Correct. And there's already, as I stated, documents that were forged post-mortem for my father. So we're still investigating all this. I've asked for records of the originals of those. I do not believe that they, well, they haven't been provided to me as a beneficiary or guardian to beneficiaries upon repeated requests to look at the original documents. Let's talk about the fabricated ones okay. for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Who fabricated them? Uh, we believe, according to her statements, that Kimberly Moran, while working for the law firm of Tesher and Spillane as a notary public, uh, fabricated the document. And then we believe that Robert Spillane fabricated another document while working for Tesher and Spillane. Okay. Is that the Shirley Amendment Trust? Uh, sh yes. Okay. Now, the waivers, do you believe that anyone other than Kim Moran played a role in fabricating the waivers? Do I believe? Oh, absolutely. I don't think she acted alone as she stated. I believe she's actually perjured herself, and I've submitted that evidence to the court and investigators. So and it contradicts certain of the statements given by Spillane and others to the police. So we are still investigating actively if Kimberly Moran actually did this alone on Deborah Bavira, which was the first excuse she used to the governor's office. And then she changed her story when she went to the police and confessed to tracing signatures and all of that stuff. But she was working, you know, and as you know, she, the law firm is responsible for the actions of their notaries. And it would be pretty hard to believe that she would do that on her own. But So my belief is no, she acted in concert. And then especially when we learned after the September 13th hearing that Spalina stated that was all the crimes he knew about was Kimberly Moran, the one-off event. And then all of a sudden, months later, he confesses that at that time that he had told the court that there was nothing else that he knew about that he then confesses to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's investigators months later that prior to that date in September 13th, he altered a trust document and sent it around, I believe, to lawyers and stuff for minor beneficiaries, which changed the beneficiaries of the estate. Okay, that's my answer. Can you just read back the question? question was, is that the Shirley Amendment Trust? That was one before that, I'm yeah. sorry. Let's talk about the fabricated one for a minute. Who fabricated them? And then, and then he went to the answer. Do you believe according to her statement? I don't want to hear the whole answer. What was my next question after that? The question is that is, okay, is that the Shirley Amendment Trust? Okay. Answer yes. All right. That would right, be the question now, the yeah, waiver. We're, we're down to the bottom. We're ready that to would go. Be sure. No Shirley's questions. No, no question pending. Oh, okay. Who do you believe assisted Kimberly Moran in fabricating the six fraudulent waivers? Robert Spillina, Don Tesher, and Ted Bernstein, most likely. Or do you believe that Robert Spillina did it? I believe he oversaw it. And what's your level of certainty of that? I believe that. Okay. With what degree of certainty? 
I, I'm not, that's a subjective question. How about Don Tesher? Do you think I, he I'm was waiting for investigators? You think Don Tesher was involved in that? Absolutely. He was the key to the whole account. He was the head guy, the guy in charge of this account. Do you believe Ted was involved with fabricating waiver documents? Absolutely. And what basis, what facts do you have to support that? The Ted's been advancing the schemes underlying the, the document forgeries and the attempts to change the beneficiaries to include him, in it, or not him, he's been cut out no matter what way this is divided up, considered predeceased, but to get his children, his family, uh, back into the estates and trust as beneficiaries. So all these documents that are alleged frauded and forged and those admitted and proven forged and fraudulent um, all benefit Ted's attempt to get back into the estates and trusts because he was predeceased with his sister Pamela by both of his parents in the 2008 trusts and estate plans they did. And in the 2012, Ted is still and Pam cut out and considered predeceased. So they were basically disinherited and Ted's been trying to get back in through whatever mechanisms and his attorneys aided and embedded that. When has Ted Bernstein ever suggested that he's a beneficiary of any of the estates or trusts of he's, his parents? He hasn't, as he's alleging that his children are. And they were, Ted, Pam, and their lineal descendants were considered predeceased by both of my parents in their 2008 plans and then in the alleged documents of my father in 2012 done 48 days before he died allegedly were, again, because of the notary problems, we can't even say if he was there that day. And there's other problems, by the way, if you want to get into those. Go. Tell me any problems you have. Okay. We're here for. Um, well, actually, um, the two witnesses on the wills and trusts, I believe, are Don Tesh or uh, Robert Spilina and Kimberly Moran, two people who have already admitted to being involved in fraud in these matters. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Do you believe that the 2008 will of Shirley Bernstein that has been filed in the probate court is valid? No, I haven't seen an original copy. I've requested it from the, in fact, I think Ben Brown is saying it was destroyed now or something, or I don't know. But I haven't seen, I've requested it from the fiduciaries, and again, the transparency here has been uh, like a black hole. We, we've, this beneficiary has been denied documents for two years. Okay, so as you see there today, you have no idea where the original will would be located. Correct. Okay. Have you seen a copy of the will? An alleged copy. But again, with all the fraudulent stuff going on here, we're going to want to see all the originals before we make any affirmations as to the validity of these documents. I think Judge Colin's aware that we're all wanting these documents. Uh, from Tesher and Spilina's production, we found out there's no, they sent one piece of paper that was an original document in Simon's estate, uh, which has caused red flags all over the place, but okay. If you saw an original, and it looked exactly like the copy you've seen, would you then believe that it was a genuine will of your mother? After I have it forensically examined, yes. Okay. Are you familiar with your mother's signature? I would have it forensically examined with at this point. Okay. How many years ago did your mother die? She died in uh, uh, 2010. Okay. Have, you brought an action to, have you brought an action to revoke her will from probate? Yeah. You have? Yeah, my first petition, I allege that the documents are challenged based on the frauds and forgeries, and we need to see some uh, original documents. And I was challenging everything based on the fraud. And I think fraud invalidates any statutes that might limit the ability to challenge, according to what I've heard. Is, is there anything in this case you're not going to challenge? That's a great question, but I doubt until I see the original documents and the fiduciaries turn over the documents, as they're required to by law, no. So you can basically stop asking that whole line of questions because I'm not going to verify one of these documents for you because we've already found in the copies frauds and forged documents in my name, my deceased father's name, my brother's name. My brother gets dis documents forged in his name, never even reports it as a fiduciary. Can you imagine that? As a fiduciary, Alan, he never reported 
that his name had been forged or his deceased father's. He had to wait till the investigators contacted him. He had the documents for months and never notified the court even. Now, in your view, Ted has been purporting to serve as a fiduciary for some period of time, correct? Correct. Has Ted, during that time, done anything at all that you think was good or beneficial for the beneficiaries of the estate? Not a single thing. And the same question for the trust? Not a single thing. Nor has he complied with any estate no. rules, probate rules, trust code rules, nothing. Okay. There's so many, I, I, it takes me 100 pages per pleading to cite the amounts of violations there are. If we look at the will... Is it an original? <clears throat> if I looked at the conformed copy of your will of your mother... Is that court stamp? It's a conformed copy. It's got to have a court clerk stamp on it. Can you show me that, please? For the record, well, well, conformed. You know what it means. Well, I'm, I'm so show me the clerk's signature on that document. Otherwise, we're looking at another potentially problematic document. Can I see that document, please? No, it's my deposition. You don't get to do anything but answer my questions. Sir. Oh, okay. But I'm well, going to show you the answer. document. I'm, not, I'm going to okay. show you the document. Okay. But I'd, I'd prefer if you if you realize that it's not my deposition. Great, I get okay. it. All right. I am allowed to ask you clarifying questions. I think you know that as an attorney. Which is more of your abusive harassment. Do you have any attorney representing you currently? No. Do you have any attorneys you're consulting with? Attorneys I'm consulting with? Yeah. I consult with attorneys all the time. Do you have any attorneys who believe they are representing you and giving you legal advice? No. Okay. So none of the lawyers that you send emails to are currently. Oh my God, I got you. hundreds of friends that are lawyers over the years that I sold insurance for my family and sold some of the biggest law firms in the country. Come on, Alan. I, I got a lot of friends that are attorneys that I talk to. So, no, none of them are billing me and charging me for legal services. And do you consider any of them to be your counsel? Your legal? No. Okay. I'm pro se. Don't you get it? Otherwise, they'd be sitting here. By the way, I've asked the fiduciaries okay. to provide counsel. No, this is a very important point I'd like to make since you asked that question. Um, I've asked the fiduciaries to provide counsel because this is, for example, your deposition you think is necessary for the estate, and you know that I've been limited funds because for two years my inheritance has been delayed by the act of the fiduciaries who have caused all this delay due to their frauds and forgeries and other crimes against my family that have been, that have, are, are you paying attention? No, you can make your speech go. Oh, okay. I'm done. Okay. So, what I have in my hands is a document that says Will of Shirley Bernstein, and it's stamped conformed copy, but not by the clerk of the court. So, is it conformed? Can you explain to me as a lawyer what conform means? Well, I was about to interrupt. Oh, okay. It's stamped conform copy, and it states the original of this will is being held in the safe deposit box of the law firm of Tesher and Spelina, PA. Okay. Have you seen a document similar to this one? Here, can I see the document? Absolutely. I don't see a, a clerk statement signature on this document showing that it's a conformed copy. Well, that wasn't my question. Have you seen it? Have you seen a you copy? Ask me, this is a conformed copy. I'm saying it's a stamp that, but it's not an actual conformed copy, okay. according to the law. So, you know, again, with so much document forgery and fraud going on in this case, and incomplete documents, improperly notarized, all kinds of problems, I, you got to be skeptical of every document. It's funny that the fiduciaries aren't, they're hiding all the documents. But okay, let's, let's, you want me to look at this for some reason as some form of copy? Are you saying it's conformed as you handed it to me, Alan? Is it a conformed copy? Was that the question? Okay. The, the document says at the top of, on, the, on page two. Well, it could say anything, but to be conformed okay. according to I, law. I'm not talking about a, a clerk conform copy. Does it, say, does it have the word? Well, then it's not conform. What's the meaning of conform legally? Sir, would you, does it have the words conform copy on it? It does, but okay. it's not a conformed copy. As well. Are I, you saying it's conformed copy? Just because it's stamped that on it. Okay. My this, dad's signature was signed on a document after he was dead. So, okay, Do, yes or no? 
I'm confused by the question. I need some clarification. Are you alleging that's a conformed copy? This one time only, I will give you some help and information that might help you. Certain lawyers believe that the will, the original of the will, has extreme significance, and a copy of the will with the stamp conformed copy is a document that can be sent to various people because the original of the will has special significance in the law. My only conformed question is, means that a clerk would have stamped this well, as conformed, conformed copy, right? Conformed can have many meanings. It can? I'm not Legally? suggesting to you that this is a con clerk's conformed okay, copy. Okay, I'll go on the fact that I'm looking at a copy. Have you ever seen a will. copy of a document that looked like this one? Yes. Have you ever seen a document that said will of Shirley Bernstein from 2008 that looked different than this one? I don't know. I'm not looking at all the documents, but I, I find a lot of differences in certain documents. That's not my question. Have you ever found a different version of the 2008 will of Shirley Burns? I've never seen that. Uh, that's what I'm saying. I've, I've never been allowed access to the original documents to see if it's the will of Shirley. That wasn't I mean, my question. What? Have I seen a copy of something I've never seen? I don't know. No, I mean, I don't know if this is a copy or if you typed this up this morning, Al. Mr. Burns. You know, you know what I mean? I, I, we're in a case where the documents are consistently shoddy, the fraudulent, criminal fraud, felony criminal fraud with the rest and stuff. You're asking me to verify documents that I'm not going to verify. So I, I've seen. I didn't ask you to verify the document. Okay. okay. I, secondly, you, you said, you, is you, this the same document? Is this a copy of Shirley's will? I don't know I don't, th that I can say that. Okay. Let me ask you a question you can answer. Okay. First of all, you. I would prefer if you quit mention. Well, I'll strike oh, that. Oh, by the way, it's not. No, did she initial each page of her thing? Okay, so no, she didn't initial this will conformed copy on each page, or does that not have those? This doesn't actually have anybody's signatures in the back. Okay, can, can we try to answer my questions? Mm -hmm. I'm, an I'm answering them as best as I can. Okay. Have you seen something that looked like this piece of paper before? Well, it had signatures, I think, back here. These don't have any signatures. This has a bunch of names where the signatures should be. Is there a reason for that? So it looks different. I don't know. I've seen several copies of the same looking thing. Some with signatures. This one has names typed in, but no signatures. Okay, so let's focus on my question. Oh, no notary stamps either. Okay. If you put aside the, the signing of the document, that I'm focusing on the text. Have you seen before today a copy of a will of Shirley Bernstein that had the same terms as this one has? A copy of the will of Shirley Bernstein? No, I've never will. seen the will of Shirley Bernstein, so I don't know if it's a copy of it. I need to see the original. I've requested that repeatedly. I'm, I'm being denied as a beneficiary. So how would you want me to say that it's a copy of a will that I've never I, seen? I didn't ask you... If if, I, I don't want to find out if this is a genuine document right now. I want to ask if you've ever seen a document that had the same terms as this one. A document? Uh, I believe so. Have you ever seen, say, have you read this before, the will, the copy that you're given that, you, that may you not be genuine? You want me to read the whole thing? Sure, go ahead.
Okay, what was your question? Have you ever seen a document that had the same wording as this document that purported to be a will of your mother, even though it's not uh, signed with original ink and notarized, and even though the document didn't have a clerk's stamp? And each page is an initial. Um, I believe, I can't be for 100% sure, but if I can get a copy of this, I'll you know, scan it and match it up to all the other ones to make sure there was no minor changes. But from the surface, it looks okay. Have you ever seen any document of any kind, original, stamped, notarized, blessed by the Pope, anything that had Are you being terms or different that, than this? Are you making jokes at me? Is that kind of like... No. Oh, okay, the Pope? Well, I didn't get that reference. Well, I would think if the Pope blessed the document, most people would think it was genuine. So you're asking me genuine documents. Well, your question just before let me do this. Wasn't let me, let me withdraw my question. And so ask you. yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. Okay. Have you ever seen a document? And put it on the record kind. that I believe he's belittling me and ridiculing me. Okay, but go ahead. Well, I'll put on the record that I'm not belittling you. Okay. And I'm not yes, insulting right. you. I'm asking questions to get to the truth of, of information. Hmm. So, have that. you ever seen pieces of paper? that had similar wording purporting to be the will of your mother that were different from the wording that is in the document that you just looked at? One more time. Okay. Have you ever seen a different version of your mother's will than the one I have in front yes. of me? Yes. Where did you see that? I was sent it by, I believe, uh, somebody. I think it was sent to me by my children's counsel at one point. Other than notarization, initials, original signatures, was there anything different about oh, the will? Oh, I told you, you I'd have to scan it in as next you, as to the other here, documents. As you sit here today, you're not aware of anything in the, the document well, I've showed you that's the I don't will. have any of the other ones. So if you want to give me all of them, I'll sit here and go through them all and look for commas and things that have changed because we find things that have changed in these documents as we start to forensically examine them. So at this point, I don't want to say that that's a true statement. As you sit here today, are you aware of any version of the will of Shirley Bernstein that is different than the one that you looked at? Well, yeah, of course, like you just said, there's missing signatures, initials, the conformed copy doesn't even have a clerk stamp. So yeah, you know, I've seen a different document that looks similar. I don't have those documents in front of me today, but if you want me to sit and go through line by line, word by word, comma by comma, I'm more than happy to do it. As have soon you, as you give me that one, I'm going to actually do that to that one. Have you seen any document that says that it is the will of Shirley Bernstein from 2008 that lists you as a beneficiary of her estate? Have I seen what? Any document which purports to be the will of Shirley Bernstein from 2008 that makes you a beneficiary of any in any way of her estate? I've seen documents um, that are alleged to be copies of a will of my mother's that I uh, have us as, I believe, the siblings as personal property, or their children as personal property beneficiaries, which I believe would make us beneficiaries interested parties. And what year is that? What? The will you're mentioning that you saw. The purported will that I've seen is 2008. And the 2008 will that I have in front of me doesn't mention, other than mentioning that you are a child of Shirley Bernstein does not make you a beneficiary in any way, shape, or form of the well, estate of well, Shirley Bernstein. Well, that's incorrect because it pours over into a trust where I'm one of the three of five children. That's the beneficiary. So, so it, th that document pours into a trust where my brother Ted and sister Pam have been wholly considered predeceased, so they're not beneficiaries in any way. But I believe that me, Lisa, and Jill would be able to claim that you know the pour over to that trust makes us beneficiaries. And you've seen a document that purports to be the will of your mother and lists as her success, successor personal representatives by name Simon and Ted one at a time and successively in that order. Have you seen that document? I have seen an alleged copy of my mother's 
will. But again, when we've asked to see the originals, and we'll get to why I believe that Ted almost is excluded by language in these documents from having any rights considered that he was predeceased in the other dispositive documents. But yeah, I've seen that document. Have you seen any document that, that purports to be a will of your mother from 2008 that does not list Ted as her successor personal representative? Not at this time. Are you familiar with your mother's signature? Uh, you fairly. Cut some exhibit stickers. I wouldn't want to say anything till I have a forensic investigator well, look at all the documents, you, but if you're showing me originals. Are you familiar with your mother's signature? I am. You think you'd be able to be able to identify your mother's signatures on various documents? No. I'm not an expert in that. I didn't ask you for an expert. I asked you for familiar. Let me hand you exhibit number one. I ask you if you, by looking at that, can determine if any of those are, in fact, your mother's signatures. No. And no, they don't look even identical on the ones you're giving me. Be sure that this has got Simon in it, too. Your exhibit, you want to rip that page out? Nope. You want to leave Simon in Shirley's? You want me to confirm that Simon's signature is Shirley's? I'm well, confused. Michael, well, I think I said to you, sure, you look at page one of exhibit one, does oh, that look like your mother's signature? Uh, no, not really. How about page two of exhibit one? No, not really. How about page three of exhibit one? No, not really. How about page four of exhibit one, is that your father's signature? Mm, doesn't look much like a... Like I said, would it matter to you to know what documents these signatures came from before you answered whether they were genuine signatures? I, uh, no. Okay. They're copies of a document. These aren't original signatures you're asking me to verify. And like I said, there's already been forged documents with their signatures that look pretty good. In fact, Ted, your client, suggested that the forged document waiver of my father's was his signature. Okay, exhibit number two. I'd ask you to take a look at the signature Are pages. Are you throwing things at me? I mean, seriously, I detect a lot of hostility here. No, nope, from you throwing over the You just threw Sir, that document. I, I didn't throw it at you. I, I put you? it up. Um, okay. You seem very upset. Are you upset? No. You seem to be. Well. No. I'd ask you to take a look at exhibit number two. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Okay. Do you, do, you, do you see anywhere in there where it purports to be your father's signature? Where it purports to be my father's? It purports to be a copy of my father's signature. Do you see where it purports to be a copy of your father's I do. signature? Does that appear to be a genuine signature of your father? No. Okay. We'll turn to the next page. And it's your mother. Does that purport to be, or appear to be a genuine copy of a signature of your mother. A genuine copy of a signature of my mother? I don't know. It doesn't look much like the other signatures of my mother's that I just you just handed me, actually. Okay. So, no. Okay, so for exhibit two, neither I'm of those signatures looks like your mother or father? No. Okay. That's why we want them all forensically investigated. Do you, have, do, you have, do you have any idea how much to turn them over? Do you have any idea how much it would cost to forensically investigate every document in this case? Probably not as much as it's cost Ted and his team of seven lawyers to defend him through all this. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, I don't. But I'm sure we're going to get to that. What who the should cost bear the cost of the lawyers who committed the frauds and forgeries that are causing all the documents to now be investigated that the fiduciary still refuses to turn over to the beneficiaries. What's that Those for? people should be paying the damages cost to my family that held up our inheritances, have financially devastated us while we've had to go through and catch them in forgery and fraud and then, you know, to police departments and all this wasted money. But, you know, again, somebody's going to have to forensically do it. Do you have an idea of what it's going to cost? What seven lawyers did Ted have? Well, I don't know. He's had Greenberg Traug in the Stansbury case that's related to the thing. He, I, I can't remember who the first law firm he had in that case was. 
and then Greenberg left for conflicts, and I believe he got Mr. Mancieri, who then resigned, admits to all, when Judge Colin threatened to read him his Mirandas, and he was a smart one and got out. Uh, then you, and then John Pankowski, uh, hmm, I'm trying to think if I'm missing anybody here. Uh, and I think that covers most of them off if I can think of any more. Now, you You're the last man standing, I think. All the other ones have resigned for irreconcilable differences and admits they're being, uh, admitting fraud. How soon after I got involved representing Ted did you believe that I had a conflict of interest and should immediately withdraw? I believed because since you were involved in this case since day one and there's been fraud on the court, that all people who were involved with the fraud, Ted's counsels, were the ones who did this. They were the ones who contracted you. So of course, I feel that because you're involved in the prior fraudulent acts, whether directly or indirectly, as part of the Ted's legal team, well, you're the only one left again, but, uh, you know, I feel that, uh, that Ted has created this legal team here using estate and trust assets where he's not even a beneficiary, no matter how you slice it, to defend himself against all these crimes with lawyers like you. I Meaning you guys are blocking the beneficiaries from getting access to the documents since you've seized dominion and control of the estates. Now, Spleen and Tesser, who have admitted that their firm committed fraud, uh, brought in you through and or Ted brought you in or however that works, but it's all related to Ted and his counsel. All of these criminal acts are done by lawyers. Alan, I mean, you should be the one investigating and, you know, as fiduciaries, as counsel to a fiduciary, you know, it seems strange that I'm the beneficiary doing all this investigation and uncovering and not the fiduciary when he has a duty to protect beneficiaries from frauds. So I thought when you came into the case, and are you talking when you first began representing Ted at, in the Stansbury matter? Were you there? You asked me a question about your representation. When did I first believe you were involved? And I would say that really when you stepped into the estate matters to replace some of the former counsels of Ted that it would abandon ship on them, I don't believe you put in an attorney of record quite timely, but uh, nonetheless, you changed it after I told you it was missing from the record. But I believed you were conflicted right from day one with the people who were involved in the frauds and forgeries that have already occurred. Do you have any personal knowledge of the efforts that Ted, as trustee, has made to pursue claims against Tesher and Spillina? Um, I believe you stated on the record uh, that you had ordered a bar investigation or something. Did you have any personal knowledge of the efforts Ted has made as fiduciary to pursue claims against Tesher and Spillina? I don't know anything Ted's done as a fiduciary because there's no transparency. He's never sent notices of anything really to beneficiaries. He's never followed any of the rules of probate and trust codes. Okay. Now, I think my question was, well, when did strike I that first of all. Hmm. What do you know about my involvement in the Stansbury case? Not much. Okay. Do you speak to Bill Stansberry regularly? Yeah. How often? Uh, like every week. Okay. Is Mr. Stansberry giving you any financial support? Uh, he gave me a $500 Christmas gift. Okay. Any other financial support? Uh, he gave me uh, about probably a $250 Christmas basket to feed my family after the fiduciaries shut down our income streams. Okay. Anything else? Mm, not that I recall at this time. Mr. Stansberry loaned you any money? Not that I recall. Have you been working with Mr. Stansberry in, in, in conjunction with him in the estate matters? Yes. I actually notified him that I was approached to commit fraud on a creditor by moving an insurance policy by Ted and Spolina to hide it from Mr. Stansberry, and I thought that fraud should be absolutely brought to his attention and his counsel, and I did that 
like any good honest person would. Okay, let's take a look at exhibit number three, which I'll hand you gently so you can take it from my hands. Thank you. Is that more insult? And I'm going to continue this bantering. Does every comment have to be preceded with the, the Pope and throwing documents? I mean, I get you're upset that you're a respondent and that you're a counter defendant, and you really shouldn't probably be sitting here deposing people and representing people when you need counsel, but I get your anger and hostility at me, but can you chill? It's really, it's. Yes, what would you like me to? Do you recognize the signature of your father on this document? No. Do you see where it purports to be his signature? Yes. And do you believe that signature is not that of your father? Yes. You mean a copy of not that of my father's? Because well, it wouldn't be in our signature if it's a copy. We, we don't have any originals. Oh, you Nothing don't? I'm going to show you today is an original. So you don't have them? Why didn't you bring them? For the purpose of every question I ask you today. So the fiduciary didn't bring original documents for me to confirm all these signatures? You're trying to get me to confirm a bunch of paper copies? What was the matter? Why didn't we bring the records today? For the purposes of today, I, I'd like you to treat every question I ask as though I'm talking about the copies that we have in front of us. Well, I treat them as that you're hostile to me because you're a defendant and a respondent and you're trying to have me affirm documents that, you know, are, are copies of things that we, we've already found, fraud and forgery, by the fiduciaries in these matters on these kind of documents. So, okay, but if you want to keep asking me, no, it doesn't look like my father's signature. A copy of it. <clears throat> y yes or no, does it look like, does the copy look like a copy of something your father actually signed? I don't know if my father actually signed it because I don't see the document, but no, that doesn't look like my, a copy of my father's signature on any document. Have you seen a copy of the Shirley Bernstein Trust dated May 20, 2008? I've seen a copy of an alleged trust. Have you seen any other documents that are that that appear to be the same trust, but that have been altered in any way, other than through signatures and initialings. I don't know. I'm not looking at anything. Well, you've had two years to three years you, to study the document. Is there a document you're handing me? Am I looking at something? What was the question? Have I seen a copy of the 2012 alleged Shirley Trust? Yes, or 20, 2008. Excuse me. This is my question. Yeah, you've seen a document that purports to be the Shirley Bernstein Trust Agreement, correct? 2008, correct. You believe that's a genuine document? No. Are, are you seeking to be a beneficiary on the basis of the 2008 After trust? After we have it forensically evaluated by forensic investigators and the court approves it as a valid document, yeah. Do you know what happens if the court determines it's not a valid document and your mother did not in fact have a will or a trust? Um, I do. What happens? Well, we have to look at the analysis from what the fraud occurred and what other documents preceded it, if any, et cetera. Well, if your mother had died in test day with no will and no trust, the money would pass all to your father in any way, wouldn't it? I don't know. It's a legal question, looking for legal conclusions. Okay. Now, do you claim money under the Shirley Bernstein Trust Agreement dated May 20, 2008? I claim that under the purported document, I'm a named beneficiary with my two sisters through family trusts and that Ted and Pam were previously. So yes, I would say that I'm, my family is a uh, one-third beneficiary of that trust. And do you want the court to enforce the terms of the May 20, 2008 trust? Only if they're valid. After I see originals, I have asked for the original of that document so many times I'm going blue, but the fiduciaries continue to suppress and deny documents, which after Tesher and Spleenis production recently, where we found all kinds of secreted documents, <laughs> you know, we're waiting for you guys to turn over the documents, but you know, again, the transparency here is a black hole. Did you not get a copy of the entire file of Tesher and Spleena that he gave Ben Brown? I did get the copy that he gave to Ben Brown. Okay. Have you ever seen a 2008 trust document that's different 
than the one that has been filed as part of the trust construction lawsuit? Uh, no. Do you think there is one? I'm not sure. But you I'm still waiting. want to have a, you still want to have a forensic. I want to see the original. So you just asked me about a copy again and again. Copies have been frauded and forged in these matters by the lawyers and fiduciaries oh. who are handling the estate. So of course, nothing that's on an original we're questioning, Alan. And we're going to have them all inspected one day when you turn them over on behalf of your client, despite repeated requests. I mean, this is so violative of probate rules and trust rules that it's disgusting. What I mean, how simple is it to have me come over and look at the originals? I've been asking two years. My attorney had to fight to get even basic documents that were owed to us. And I believe you've seen her letters where she had to resign saying, you're going to have to litigate to get basic documents from these guys. And then told us to report you all to the bar and authorities, which we did. Okay, go ahead. So what's your question again? I forget, can you read it back? Oh, this is back in question. Okay, have you ever seen a 2008 trust document that is different than the one that has been filed as part of the trust construction lawsuit? Answer no. Do you think there is one? Answer I'm not sure. Do you still want to have a forensic, and then there was interruption, I want to see the originals. Okay. okay. Right, I do want to have a forensic on everything. Every single document. Okay. Now, for the, the six documents that are waivers, right, there's no forensic needed for those. We know they're oh, no. fabricated, correct? Well, no, I st still, we still want those because we don't know if Sy signed his. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the six that are genuine. I'm talking about the six that, are, that we know are fraudulent, that, that Kim Moran fabricated, correct? We don't need to have a forensic analysis of those. I would like to still, most likely. What's that going to tell us? Uh, it could determine if that her story is correct. We don't believe, like I said, she appears to have perjured herself between her statements to the governor's office and the police. I've reported that to the authorities in the courts already, in pleadings as well. And I believe until we get that, yeah, you know, we're going to have to forensically evaluate exactly how much fraud and forgery is going on with the fiduciaries and attorneys of involved in this. You are aware these are attorneys at law who committed these crimes. Well, let me see if I have this straight. We have a document that somebody fabricated. Tesher and Spolina. And everybody knows it's been fabricated. Okay. Including Well, they you. didn't know that originally. Well, it was let me, in my efforts that it, that it was discovered. It wasn't like Ted, when he got the document and knew his name was forged, came forth and told the truth. It, none of them did. In fact, they tried to write those affidavits to cover up the fraud. Do you want somebody to give you credit for uncovering that fraud? Absolutely. My parents would be very proud. What Absolutely. My dad was a very honest man. He'd be very shamed by what these attorneys have done, what okay. these other people, his own son. Maybe that's part of the reason he was considered predeceased. Okay. But I'm kind of trying to figure that out right now. But well, okay. We. We know that there were six waivers that were created and notarized after the court rejected the original waivers, correct? Yes. And you still want to have those six forensically Asked analyzed? And Asked and answered. Okay. The answer is yes. You want to have them forensically Asked analyzed. And answered. Who do you want to pay for the analysis of those documents? The people who caused the frauds. Judge Cullen said when the time's right, they're will be assessed. You're actually claiming that you you that they're that these things be paid for by them too. I just heard you in court the other day say you guys are seeking damages from them too. And and shouldn't the personal representative of the estate be the one to complain to the lawyers who whose employee engaged no, in this he conduct? Participated in the misconduct. Okay, what knowledge That's our do you have? Allegations. Well I understand it's an allegation. What facts do you have to support that Ted participated in whatever. Well, he's still trying to advance a fraudulent beneficiary scheme through your recent trust construction case where he's trying to claim that his children are beneficiaries of Shirley's trust somehow. When Robert Spolina, the guy who created the documents, went into Palm Beach County Sheriff investigators and told them that the beneficiaries of Shirley's trust are Elliot, Lisa, and Jill and cannot legally be changed, but yet. Here we are, we got it now that you're caught in the crime of taking distributions to improper beneficiaries as fiduciaries, 
and we all know that's happening because you took distributions and then allegedly say that you signed uh, or you would give the money back if it was later determined that they weren't proper beneficiaries. Can you imagine a, a fiduciary like Ted knowing that there's questions about the distributions to beneficiaries still going ahead and making those distributions? And in fact, in Spelina's police report, he states that he advised Ted as his lawyer to not take those distributions. Do you know who Molly Simon is? Yes. Who is Molly Simon? Pam Simon's daughter. Is she related to you? She is. When's the last time you spoke to Molly Simon? Oh, God, probably at my uh, father's, uh, after his funeral or something like that, around there. Yeah, do you have a close relationship with Molly Simon? Mm, I don't have a bad relationship with her that I know of. You're her uncle, right? I am. Does she have a right, the same right that you have, does she have a right to have the court determine whether she is in, allowed to take a distribution under the Shirley Bernstein Trust through your father's exercise of his power of appointment? Does she have the right to have that, same as you do? No, not okay. the same as I do because, does she have any see, right? I have a right under the right? document. Well, only because of the fraud that occurred. So now a fraud took place to try to make her a beneficiary because she's Pam's daughter. Pam was considered predeceased for all purposes with her lineal descendants, like Ted. So technically, no. But because of the fraud, she might have a claim against most likely the attorneys who caused the fraud. But I don't think under the documents, because she's considered predeceased with her mother, that she has a claim like my family does to any benefits under the trust of Shirley. That's part of the intricate fraud that's going on here. But do you think she has a right to have the judge decide everything you just said? Yeah, now that there's been an allegation that based on fraudulent documents that tried to insert her in there and the advancement of fraud, sure, she should get, absolutely. That's why I've been suggesting that they have counsel for, I don't know, two years, you know. And so you agree that the, we need to have a trust construction action because court needs to decide the validity of the documents and the validity of your father's exercise of his power of appointment. Well, we have to see the documents first, and since we're being refused those documents, it's kind of hard to have a trust construction case without knowing if the documents are even legitimate, real, original. The constant refusal, this, this black hole I've described of no documents, no accountings, nothing that complies with statutes, you know. Yeah, I think we're gonna, at some point, probably, you know, after Ted's removed, going to have to have a a trust construction or, uh, or just a verification of if the documents are legit. So yeah, we got a lot of work left to go. That's why trying to close the estate before doing all this seems more like a cover up by you and Ted than trying to get to the truth, which you actually told me in the courthouse doesn't exist. Um, but nonetheless, to get to the half truth, you believe it. I'm going to hand you exhibit number four. It, a document that has signatures of your mother and father. I ask you to look at the document. Tell me if you believe that the copy of the signature is of a document that your father actually signed. I got to say, that looks different than all the other signatures. So, again, on a document that's a copy of some document, I don't even know what it is, it does not look like the signature or the other signatures you've shown me today. Have you consulted with any document examiners? Just the police. You haven't spoken with any independent document examiners? Nope. That would you do. think that would be the fiduciary's duty, not the beneficiary's duty. <laughs> do you know if the document examiner needs an original document in order to make? I don't know. I'm not an expert. OK. I'm going to hand you exhibit gonna number five and ask. Would you please not toss the exhibits back? I'll I put it on the other wand and it slid down the conference. Well, let's just put a but stack, that's a nice mischaracterization right here. on the record. And Alan, again, I'm putting it on the record that you're harassing me. These looks that you're giving me, throwing documents at me, it's getting very disturbing. Well, for, I'm not Soon harassing I'll ask you. For I'm not protective making, order if you continue this kind of behavior. I'm not harassing you. I'm not you making are. looks at you. And did I throw a document at you? I'm not even close to you. So, but the documents you threw at me, you threw at me with anger. 
and let it stand on the record that you're obviously bothered today. Well, I'm not bothered, and you're, you're, you're continuing to make a false record. But that's why we have a video here. We I'm have just a... saying you're bothered because you're a defendant, a counter defendant in two related matters that you've been served on, and that you're a respondent in the estate cases. And Martin Cullen made you aware of that the other day, and you didn't get a lawyer. I'm, I'm kind of surprised at all this. Uh, if you go to the last page of Exhibit 5, does it appear to be a copy of something that appears to be a signature of your father? It's a copy. Again, a signature of my father would have to be on an original document. Do you so recognize that the... That looks different than all the other ones. This just <laughs> My dad must have bouncing signatures. The last eight or nine documents you show have all varied signatures. So it all looks suspect. Does that appear to be your father's signature? Uh, no. Hold on to the document. I have another question. Oh, yeah. On the last page, mm -hmm. do you know who Lindsay Baxley is? I believe Lindsay Baxley is the woman who works for Ted, who improperly notarized and was reprimanded by Governor Rick Scott's office for her improper notarization on the wills and trusts, which led to the fact that she didn't check if Cy was present at the signing of wills and trusts. Okay. Do you know, but, do you know yeah. if Lindsay Baxley worked for Simon Bernstein? No idea. I have know she worked been, for Ted. Okay. Have you ever been to the offices of Life Insurance Concepts? I think once. And how, do you know how far, how far away from your house are the offices of Life Insurance Concepts? I don't want to. And your father worked there for a number of years while you lived in Boca Raton? Correct. And your testimony you were there one time or two times? Yep. To see Ted or to see your father? My father. What type of relationship did you have with Ted for the past 15 or 20 years? 15 or 20? Virtually none. Okay. Not, not bad, not good, just bad. you had no contact? Real bad. What was bad about the relationship? Well, Ted ripped off a lot of my friends uh, who he stole commissions from, they allege. Um, he involved himself in my life in dubious ways that, uh, you know, really led to my finding Ted to be more a, a criminal type than a honest, good, upstanding citizen. Maybe the reason my parents both considered him predeceased for all purposes of their trust. Well, we know Part her mother trusted reason. him enough to make him the successor trustee of her Only will, under a, No, we don't, because we don't know, haven't ever seen her will. And like I said, there's been so much effort to make Ted those documents through this fraud and forgery that, no, I don't believe any of that. In fact, if you look at the trust, she kills him and says, for all purposes of this document, so why would she make him in the wills? It just looks like fraud. And Alan, those aren't legitimate trusts yet. You're asking me to verify copies of a document that you refuse to show me to, upon repeated requests to all of the fiduciaries for now two years in violation of virtually the entire trust in probate codes. But go ahead. What, what's, what, what do you want to know on this document, durable power of attorney? Well, the new one. I remember even seeing this one. Okay. Regardless of what you think of Ted, your mother named him as the successor trustee in her trust, correct? No. That What trust? I've never seen the trust. If your mother did, in fact, name Ted, would you honor your mother's choice of Ted as successor trustee? No, because he's not qualified now. He's unfit now from his actions currently, his breaches, his conflicts. Absolutely not. That, A, it would have been a big mistake. I don't think she ever did it. But when I see those documents, we'll be able to better determine. When we have them forensically examined, we can have them better determined. And at this point, I would say that anything that put Ted into it is, is a frauded document, which would make all these wills and trusts frauded. And maybe perhaps the reason Ted and you are hiding the documents from qualified beneficiaries for two years now. Right. Turn to the last page of exhibit number five, please. Yeah. Do you think Lindsay Baxley personally knew your father? I don't know. Did she do the notary proper on this document? I don't know. I'm not looking at an original document. Okay. Does Again. it appear that she did the notary properly? On a copy of some document? You know, well, I haven't really had time to review this document. 
Did you check the box personally now on this one? Yes. And that's your only it. criticism of the execution of Simon's 2012 will, isn't it? The fact that she didn't check that box? No. In fact, the document is witnessed by Robert Spelina, who drafts the document. And he drafts it and witnesses it with Kimberly Moran. Both of them have already admitted to fraudulent acts on documents in this case. So I have big problems with how that document was signed. That, and by the way, even further, those documents of size that were signed were signed by Psy on the will and trust. Uh, I mean, they were not only witnessed, but they were constructed to give Tesher and Spilina dominion and control over the estates by replacing Bill Stansberry. So, yes, the fact that the documents are improperly constructed, that the attorneys gained interests in the estates where they made lots of money, so much money so far that we can see, just from what they turned over in the estate regarding their excessive and abusive billings. I believe they built $165,000 at the same time they were alleging the estate was only worth $125,000 or something. But nonetheless, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's enough of my answer on that. I, I think the documents are crummy. And again, because they're being refused and denied and suppressed from beneficiaries, there's nothing that I'm going to confirm here today on those documents other than I allege that they're fraud. Would you agree with me that July 25th, 2012 is the same date that your father purports to sign his 2012 will? That my father purports? Or that you purport my father? Is that what you're asking? For clarification now? My father can't purport much because he's dead. Well, he does a lot of things while he's dead, like sign documents in this case, but would you agree thanks with me? to the attorneys. We Turn to the last stuff. page of Exhibit yeah. 5, please. And yeah. Would you agree with me that it's, it's dated July 25, 2012? This copy of a document? Correct. This copy of some document is dated July 25th. Okay. Signed by Simon Bernstein. I don't know. It appears to be signed by Simon Bernstein. It doesn't look like his signature very much, especially next to the ones you just showed me, but okay. sure. Witnessed by Robert Spillane and Kimberly Moran. Correct. And Notarized. Tesher and Spillane did do the document, as you can see down question, here. Let's focus so on my question. So he's a witness. Okay, so yeah, he's a witness and he gets interest out of the document. Okay. okay but let's focus on okay. my question so we can yep. get through here. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's notarized by Lindsay Baxley. Allegedly. And she checks the box, personally known. Allegedly. You have no idea whether she knew or didn't know your father? I, I don't. She said she worked for Ted. Where did she work for Ted? I don't know. That's from the information we got that she was Ted's assistant. Okay. I think it's on Ted's website. This is a good time for like a five minute break. We should take a back. Hand. I'd like to not because I'm not feeling well. So if we can get this done. Well, take a, I'll, I'll take a two minute break. To go to the okay. It's 1141. We're back on record. Thank you. So. Do you believe that the 2012 document, if you had an original, would be a document that your father actually signed? That's the amended and restated trust agreement? If I had the original and had it forensically examined. And how about your father's 2012 will? Have you, have you seen a copy of the will? An alleged copy of a will. I Which will? 2008 or 2012? 2012. Uh, yes. And do you believe that the 2012 will and trust of your father are consistent with his wishes? No. How are they inconsistent with his wishes? His wishes were stated when he did his plans with my mother in 2008. Ted and Pam tried to force him to change the things. He, my father asked us, me, Lisa, and Jill, if we'd be willing, if it could legally be done, to consider giving up our inheritances to include the grandchildren. He never followed up on that. He told me he was never doing it because it was illegal. He was scared of Ted at the time. Uh, there were all kinds of problems that lasted with Ted and Pam till the very day he died. So I believe that his <coughs> wishes were to cut Ted and Pam out as he and my mother had done and their lineal descendants for both the reasons that they already had taken enough from the family and other problems they had with both children. 
So it's your belief that the 2000 and the documents that say on their face that they are the 2012 will and trust of your father, you believe those documents were fraudulent? Yeah, and they yes. were created after your father died. They were never signed and executed properly by my father, I don't believe. I don't know when they created them, the documents I've seen. I've never seen the originals again, so I can't really make any statements other than based on these copies that we had to pull teeth to get. Because remember, I had to hire me, a lawyer to get the documents. Let me break down the... And then we found frauded and forged documents in those documents. So now, yes, everything to do with that purported change is is questionable. We found seven documents that we know are frauded and forged, and others that you think might be. Well, no, we also found that the wills and trusts are improperly notarized, okay. constructed Let's improperly, where the attorneys are getting interest in an estate, witnessing the documents that they created, and all those other problems. So, a lot of problems, and a lot of the documents we found were still, you know, investigating. We've still got ongoing investigations of Ted, you, and other people. Is he? Is it your position that Tesher and Spillini? cannot serve as co-trustees of the trust because they were your father's lawyers? No, I didn't okay. say that. Is it, do you see anywhere in your father's 2012 trust that Tesher and Spillane are beneficiaries? I've never seen my father's 2012 trust, the original document, so uh, what are you the, saying? The copy you've seen. If you, the it, copy I've seen states that they are, and the problem I have is that Mr. Spelina drafted the document and witnessed the document and gained interest in the documents by alleging that he's supposedly the trust co-trustee with his partner, Don, the lead partner on the case. And uh, yeah, I would say that all makes it an uh, improper document that looks more and more fraudulent. I don't know why he wouldn't have got an independent witness especially where he was granting himself power under the document. It just seems so inappropriate. I'm not sure what rules it violates, but I believe it does. I've heard that. Let, let's try to break it down. Mm -hmm. Shorter, simpler questions and shorter, simpler answers so we can move quicker. That's okay. Has anyone ever told you that Robert Spillina cannot be named as a co-trustee in the 2012 trust? Asked and answered. What's your answer? I already answered it. I stated that Robert Spolino should not have been. No, my, my question was, has yes, anyone, did anyone tell you that he could not? Yes, people have said that who? he could not. Friends of mine who have looked at names? the documents, I can't recall right now. I'll look it up on my notes when I get home, if you'd like. You can't recall the names of anyone who told you that? Well, I talked to a lot of people. You know, I talked to a lot of estate planners. I know a lot of people, I told you. Are there any estate planners that told you that a lawyer who drafts a trust cannot be named as the trustee if they the client wishes. They said it's improper and that the lawyer shouldn't then uh, sign as a witness on the document. Now, the fact that he signed the document as the witness and he's already admitted that he fraudulently altered trust documents in my mother's estate makes it highly suspect that that document's legitimate and the powers he gained under it by seizing dominion and control of the state through these documents that my dad supposedly signed when he was half out of his mind 48 days before he died, uh, virtually uh, about as bogus as can be. These documents don't appear legitimate at all. And so, you know, could he be named as successor? Sure, but as an attorney, he would have taken much better precautions had independent witnesses. The only other witness to that document is another person who admitted forging things and fraudulently notarizing, had her notary license revoked and was arrested and prosecuted for felony fraud. So yeah, you know, uh, under good circumstances, I'm sure with good attorneys who don't do fraud, that would be something that they would have taken precautions to make sure the documents weren't challengeable on the grounds that they improperly constructed them and were receiving interest from the documents they were witnessing and drafting. Same question for Don Tesher. Is it the same reasons why he shouldn't be named as co-trustee? Uh, well, yeah, the law firm is involved in it. One of the partners is signing. Yeah, sure. Okay. On July 20, uh, as of July 25th, 2012, mm -hmm. as of that date, the waivers had not yet been submitted to the court and rejected, correct? 
on July 25th. Yes, that's correct. And they, they don't get submitted till after my father's death. Right. And Kimberly Moran testified that she forged the documents after they got returned from the clerk. Well. Yes or no? Um, one more time on the question. Kimberly Moran forged the documents, fabricated them, after they were returned from the clerk. Correct. She didn't forge the documents when your father was alive. We don't know. You know for a fact that she would have had no reason to forge them until they got returned from the clerk. I don't know if she forged them when he was dead. Well, we know we did know she forged them when he was dead. Oh, okay. So what's your question? I'm confused a little bit. Well, while your father was alive, right. she hadn't forged the documents yet because they hadn't been oh, okay. submitted to the court and returned. Okay. Not I, yeah, I didn't know which waivers you were right? referring to. Okay. Yeah. And. Do you know when Mr. Spillina created the, the second First Amendment? I know what he stated to Palm Beach County. And what Sheriff did he state to Palm Beach County? I believe he stated that in uh, January of 2013. Or, yeah, January 2013, he allegedly altered the document. Do you have any reason to believe that he that that's not accurate? Yes. What's your reason to believe? Uh, it looks like there's conflicting evidence that we're putting together right now for investigators. Okay. Who's putting together evidence? Me. What evidence are you putting together? Oh, just various conflicting statements that he's made in his Palm Beach County Sheriff's report that don't match up with documents and evidence we have. Have you seen any of the forensic computer records of the Tesher and Spillina law firm to determine when the document was created? Uh, I don't believe they sent detailed billings with their okay. with their accountings or anything else that's been challenged as making it. I think people are actually asking for the money back because we don't have details. Do you have any evidence that Mr. Spillina altered the First Amendment to Shirley's trust while Simon was alive? No. And isn't it more logical that he would have altered it after your father died when you, through counsel, began to ask questions about the documents? Yeah. Okay. So if of the two frauds and forgeries we know about happened after your father died, correct? Correct. So as of July 25th, when your father purports to sign his did my father amended purport? trust. Again, my father is dead. When did he purport that? On July 25th, when your father, in fact, signed a will and signed a trust according to the testimony of witnesses and a notarization, but there had been no fraud committed yet. Improper. We can't there had been no fraud committed yet. Is that true? I don't know. Okay. And your only complaint about the, the, the execution of the 2012 documents is Ms. Baxley forgot to check the box personally known on the notarization, correct? I asked and answered. And did you report her to the Florida Secretary of State or whoever's in charge of notaries? Governor Rick Scott's office, yes, I did. Did you raise any other objection in your complaint other than that she failed to check the box? Well, that box, it's one of the three principal notary functions. So for a notary, for a notary to, well, I want to put, I want to clarify. The box you're referring to is the box that says that Simon Bernstein appeared that day to sign the documents. Well, that's, not, actually, that's not exactly true. It's, it's the box that says either he was personally known to her or he produced identification. Those are the two choices. On that day that he signed the document. Right. He produced identification or he, she, he was sitting there and she knew him. Well, Correct? So it identifies that you're there the day of your notarization. But if you want to mischaracterize the, how it is, that's fine. Are you a notary public? No. Have you ever been licensed as a notary public? No, nope, but I read all the rules after I found notary fraud and got it removed and all that, and I became semi an expert. But what would you like to know? When the notary signs the piece of paper, they're confirming that the person whose signature they're notarizing was in their presence and signed the document in their presence, correct? Correct. And then in order to make sure that for example, an imposter does not go in and say, I'm Simon Bernstein here to execute my documents. The notary is required to do one of two things, either already know who the person is or obtain some identification sufficient to confirm that the person is who he purports to be on that day. True? They are required to check a box confirming that the person before them notarizing the document is that person. 
And the purpose of checking the box is so that if there's ever a question and they say, how did Lindsay Baxley know this person, the answer would be on, on the piece of paper. Either she knew him or he gave some identification, correct? No, she has to answer it that day as if he's standing there. It's one of the three functions, critical functions of a notary. I understand. And she did it on multiple documents. She's supposed to? And you just showed me one where she did it right, supposedly. So it seems she's even inconsistent in how she's messing up the documents. But at the purpose of her checking... But these the are a will and trust that lawyers should have reviewed, obviously, and seen things like that. It shouldn't have come to beneficiaries for us to go investigate. And then when we found out those things, the fact that they didn't go to the court for months and months after all the fiduciaries and counsel had evidence that there was fraud and forgery and un improperly notarized documents, they didn't go report any of that, even though they knew it even no. though they were involved in it. I had to recruit investigators, dig deep, spend a lot of money and time and effort doing it. Now, do you want Judge Colin to invalidate the 2012 will and the 2012 trust because Ms. Baxley failed to check the box that said, personally, no? That's a legal conclusion. Well, no, but it is a legal conclusion I'm whether he'll grant it. I'm asking I'm you, are you requesting him, are you requesting that relief? I'm requesting the relief that we first see all the documents, have them forensically analyzed, like Judge Colin said in the estate when he appointed Ted, we'd be getting all the documents, we'd be getting an accounting before the estate was closed. I don't know if you were there then, but if you read the hearing transcripts, Ted, since he's been appointed, I believe on October 18th, I don't, I don't know if he ever sent out letters to anybody because I didn't get him as a beneficiary uh, after Judge Colin, so I don't even know if he has letters at this point. Have you read um, the whole transcript? Of which day? September 13th. Yeah. You seem to like pages 15 and 16 because that's where the judge uses the Miranda rights statement, but have you read the rest of it? Yes. Did you read the part where the judge said to you, I want you to understand something? Let's say you prove what seems perhaps to be easy, that Moran notarized your signature, your father's signature, other people's signatures after you signed it, and you signed it without the notary there, and they signed it afterwards. That may be a wrongdoing on her part as far as her notary public ability, but the question is, unless someone claims and proves forgery, <laughs> the document will report to be the document of the person who signs it. Correct. Did you, did you recall him saying that to you? I do, and we proved the okay. forgery. Is, it, is this your signature on, and I'll mark it, That's exhibit number six. Is this your signature on the document that's marked as exhibit number six? I don't know. It's a copy. It's awful broken up. It doesn't look like the signature. I would have signed it on the document. I had handwritten notes. I've asked to see the original of this document, but still, no. Is it your testimony? that on the actual document, the original of the document, you hand wrote notes yep. on the document? Yep. On that exhibit? Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Well, on a purported on, on, on the original of that? I don't know. I haven't seen the original. No, but let's talk I'm about I'm asking the for the original. I've no. asked for it several times. Okay. Who created the original of that document? Tesher and Spolino. Well, they created a piece of paper. Okay. And they, they sent it to you and you printed it out, right? Correct. And you could have printed out 100 copies of it. Correct. And we wouldn't know which one of those was the original, correct? Correct. And then the, the one of them, though, we would all agree is the original, right? Correct. And that would have blue ink signature of some human being. Correct. And what human being? Purportedly me. Well, not purportedly. The human well, being who signed it would have been you. Well, it could have been Kimberly Moran forging it. Did you sign the document at any point in time? I, what doc, I'm not looking at an original, so again, I don't believe this is an original document, and I therefore question my signature. Well, that's a copy. I, I'm not trying a to trick you. Well, it's a copy of what? It's a copy of whatever it is. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> it's a copy uh, of right? It's a copy of what? Where's the original? What is it? Okay, when I see the original, I'll attest to my signature. Until then, that's a copy, and it doesn't even look very good, as you notice. 
the signature is all broken up. It's not in blue ink, so I don't know. With so many forged and fraudulent documents in my dead dad's name, in my brother's name, in my name, I mean, that could be the one she forged. It could be a copy of the one she forged. It could be a second copy of a copy she forged. She seems to say she was tracing signatures on all these people, so I don't know. I'm not going to attest to that beyond what I've said, okay. asked and answered a few times already. I told you, I'm not going to attest to any of these documents till I see the originals. What is the problem? Why can't fiduciaries produce original documents for inspection to beneficiaries, especially in light of the fraud? Alan, you're his counsel. Did you receive a copy of this document that did not have the words May 15th written on it, did not appear to have anyone having written on the signature line for Elliot Bernstein and did not have a stamp of the clerk of the court? I'm not sure it's the same document. I'd have to see the original. You, do you have the original with you? Did you? Do you that's just a copy. Again, it, it, it doesn't even look like my signature. You can see it's all blocked, like computer blocked. If we could, can we show that to the record? It's all blocked up computer. I said that, you know, I don't know. I, mean, I don't want to be difficult, but in a situation where there's so much forgery and fraud going on to do fraudulent acts, you know, again, I, I'd like to see the originals if you'd like me to attest to any documents. And yes, I do believe there was handwriting on the original document. Okay, and what, what was handwritten on the original document? The same thing that was in the email, that I was only signing it because my father was under grave duress, and that duress was caused by Ted and Pam, who had, you know, caused the, the, the meeting to happen in the first place because they had denied him visitation to their grandchildren and had boycotted him basically. I was in fact the one who tried to bring Ted and my father back together. As you'll notice in my first petition exhibit one, Ted says his family is dead for all purposes other than Deborah and his children. I mean me and my father to Ted at that time were considered dead. Uh, that's how good his relationship was with right before that. So I called my dad and said, you know, what is going on? And he kind of explained to me what was going on. He kind of explained to me that Ted and Pam had been tipped off, that they were cut out, and they were very upset that they'd been disinherited and they were waging war on him, basically. That caused him so much stress to have a meeting where he considered making changes to he and Shirley's plans just to stop the abuse from Ted and Pam. Like I said, Ted and Pam came to that meeting with nothing to offer. They were already cut out. The only people who could have made changes were the beneficiaries, me, Lisa, and Jill, who were being asked if we would consider. So when I hand wrote on this document, I said to Tesher and Spolina, hey guys, at the, basically I said, um, if, do you have the email? Because it'll give you the exact words. No, for the record. I have it. I'm gonna, we're going to get there. I'm just oh, waiting okay, for good. you to finish your answer to this question. So basically, the reason I wrote a hand note on there was because I was signing this document without seeing any of the documents that in here I was alleging to be true. So I said, the only reason I'm signing this is because my dad's under duress and I'm waiting to see the documents so that I have informed consent to what I'm signing. I still don't have all the documents. It's, it's almost three years later, two and a half years later. So the statements on this thing that I signed are false. And as I said in the September 13th hearing, I lied on this statement that I signed only because my father, who had, could have been killed by what was going on. I Meaning it almost looked like they were trying to murder him by holding all the grandchildren from him. They even tried to recruit me into that scheme, Ted's children, saying that we had a boycott side because of his girlfriend. And Cy was going to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, one of those two, Patricia Fitzmaurice, over the stress it was causing him. And, and he had a very, you know, he had stints inside stints. He had all kinds of heart and other issues. So I signed it to literally in fear that he would be killed. But I did put the note there to tell Tesha and Spolina until I had the documents that I couldn't attest to any of what I had just signed. Okay. Okay. So they send you a blank document and ask you to sign it? Yeah, basically. Do you, does that document look like similar to the blank? I don't know until I see the original document. Well, I'd have to see the, the original. This document does not look like the one. Do you have a so. copy of a document at home? Mm -hmm, I do. Okay. Does it look like that? 
I don't know. I'd have to compare it and, you know, with all the forgery and fraud going on in this case by the attorneys and the fiduciaries who are responsible for the estate. You're damn right I'm questioning everything. So I'm not going to sit here and attest to documents to make your story true when you're holding all the documents and you're doing that in violation of probate rules and statutes and trust codes. You don't know where the original this is? I believe it would be a Tesher and Spilina's. Okay. Did, did you at one point have the original in your possession of some document? Yes. Because as soon as you signed it, you would have possession of it? Yes. And then you scanned it and emailed it to Tesher and scanned nope. it with an email? Nope. I sent that one, the one with the handwriting, via mail. I emailed them probably one that didn't have the writing on it because I put it in the email notice. Okay. But as you'll notice in Kimberly Moran's statements to the Palm Beach County Sheriff and Governor's Office, she received back from me the original signed document. Okay. So the, the copy that you emailed yeah. might not have had your handwriting on it, Correct. but the original that would have had your blue ink signature yes. definitely had your handwriting on Correct. it. Correct. Okay. And if I could find I that... I didn't say definitely, I said I believe. Well. How, so, how certain are you? I'm pretty certain. Okay. If I find the original, I don't know where it is, but if I found the original, strike you that. You don't know where it is? I said strike that. You did? I said strike Why that. Why are we striking it? Because I'm, my question, I'm striking oh, okay. my question. Okay. Okay. If the court sees the original of your waiver, it should have some notation on it that's similar to what you wrote in the email. I right? believe so. Okay. Let's take a look at the email. This is, I think we're at the exhibit number seven. Okay. You still have six in front of you? You might want to keep six in front of you because... Uh, you might, I want to make sure that seven relates to six. Is this an email that you sent to Robert Spilina? This is allegedly an email I sent to Robert Spilina. Okay. Did you scan the original waiver and email it to Robert Spilina with this email transmission? I, I scanned one. And then when I sent him the original, I wrote the comments here, I believe, that were in the email on the original document. No, I understand. But okay. I'm, the first thing you did was you emailed him a copy that didn't that, have the handwritten notation right. on it. Correct. But it had this email. Correct. And that was sent by email. Correct. By you. Correct. You'd have the ability to go back and pull the email and make sure that Correct. what I've handed you is a legitimate, genuine well, copy will. of your Trust email. Trust me, I will, especially okay. with the things you've been handing out. Well, you've had this for... Okay. You, you've already saying. had this... Well, You've had I, this document. I will do it. I'm getting a copy of these exhibits. I'll check every single. Well, you've had document. this document for 20 days, right? Which document? The document I just handed you. I have. Yeah, it's exhibit B to our. It's exhibit B or C to our motion for reclosing the estate. Okay, probably then. Okay, so in the last 20 days, you haven't looked to determine if that was your genuine. Well, email. I told you these last 20 days that you've been harassing me every day of. Um, I've been going through medical procedures that you know I'm not as cognizant as I normally am because they've had me medicated. Okay. So okay. take a look at the email. Did yep. you recall sending an email similar to that to Mr. Spilina? I do. Okay. And if you would read, I mean, I, I don't have an extra copy. Do you mind if I look at the same yep. copy you have? Sure. Okay. I'm so, going to read the whole thing if that's what you want, the whatever. Paragraph. I'm not cutting and pasting. We're not cutting and pasting. Okay, good. What okay. do you want me to read? Is the, first of all, it says private and confidential, May 17, 2012. Does that look accurate to you? Uh, yeah. Would you, have, would you have believed that this waiver was a confidential document? Um, no, most of my documents say that on it. Okay. And it's it's to Mr. Spilina at his, what, what I office. guess would be his office address. Uh, yeah, correct. Okay. Hi, Robert. Attached is the waiver of accounting and portions of petition for discharge, waiver of service of petition for discharge, and receipt of beneficiary and consent to discharge. Do you see where you wrote that? I do. Is that the exact title of the document that's Exhibit 6? I believe so. As I mentioned in the phone call, I have not seen any of the underlying estate documents or my mother's will at this point, yet I signed this document after our family call so that my father can be released of his duties as personal representative and put whatever matters that were causing him stress to rest. Do you see that? I do. Did you write that? I did. For my trustees, I would like the following, and then you list three individuals. Correct. Carolyn 
Prochotska Rogers? Correct. And who is she? She's a friend of mine from Chicago. Was she an investor in iViewit? No. And she didn't, was she a lawyer for iViewit? Uh, no. She wasn't involved in the iViewit case at all? Uh, no. Do you know why you would have listed her in the iViewit petition as I love her. an investor? I love her. I love uh, her. In the iViewit what? Lawsuit? When you had a list of people where there were investors, why you would have listed her? Uh, I don't. I'll okay. have to look at it. But she wasn't an investor? I don't believe so. Okay. How about Michelle Mulrooney? Who is Michelle? Uh, she's an estate lawyer. Okay. She, and she's a friend of yours? She's a friend of mine. Okay. She's not representing you in this? No. You copy her on everything in this case? Uh, yeah, most of it. Does she ever talk to you about the things that you sent no. her? No, no, no. When's the last time you spoke to her? Oh, a few years ago. How about Carolyn? Uh, I speak to her every so often. I don't recall the last time. Okay. And Andrew and Donna D2 are they? Friends. Okay. Then it says, please send copies of all estate documents to Carolyn and Michelle. And if my dad would like them to keep the information private and confidential, including from me until some later point in time, you can arrange that with them directly with my approval granted here. Do you see that? Yep. Please also reply to this email to confirm receipt. A hard copy of my signed document will be sent by via, via email. Email. A hard copy of my signed document. Okay. That, so I might not have been correct when I assumed I sent them the email copy. I don't know. I'll have to look at my records. Okay. It doesn't appear from this that I did. Okay. Did you then print out the email itself and put your signature on it? Your initials with your thumbprint? I don't recall. I'll have to look at my files. Again, you know, people have been, this is a copy. It's hard to know. For how long have you been thumbprinting and initialing documents? Well, since we discovered that documents were being falsified in other court cases. And Which court changed, cases were those? Uh, those were the billing case of Proskauer Rose versus I view it. Um, with under Jorge Labarga was the judge. Um, okay. That was the first case we realized that documents were being tampered with. I believe the records were removed by authorities from the case from the courthouse. And you sued Judge Labarga at some point? Yeah. Okay. If you uh, if you look at exhibit number seven is. Are you telling us that you told somebody that they could not use your waiver until you had seen the documents? Yeah, I told them several times that until I had the documents to verify that I was, what the statements I was making, if you look at the document, for example, it says, expressly acknowledges that the undersigned has actual knowledge of the amount and manner of determining the compensation of the personal representative. Without the documents, obviously, that's untrue. Attorneys, accountants, or other, other agent has agreed to the amount and manner of determining such compensation and waives any objection on the payment. Well, since I didn't have anything about their compensation sent to me, which they said they would be sending me all those documents, okay. obviously. Okay, well, now, wait, it also, you asked me a question. Um, I don't know if I asked you that question. We don't need to, you've just told me there's a lot of things in there. Acknowledges that receipt of complete distribution of the share of the estate to which the undersigned was entitled. I never received that at this time. So I basically signed this document to prevent the stress that my brother and sister were causing my father that I thought could kill him. He was seeking medical treatment for it. He was distressed already depressed over my mother when these animals went all over him. And the bottom line is that I was saying to them, as I said in the letter, until I see all the documents, I really can't affirm those statements. I did this to help my father. But whatever you said, you said in the email, correct? Uh, yeah, pretty okay. much. And you think you wrote the same type of language on the original yeah, Blue so. Ink signature document? Yeah. Okay. You don't know where that is at this point. But you did just mail I sent it. it to, well, Kimberly Moran, I believe the test that she got that. Okay, so whatever they received in the mail from you, now they may have fabricated or altered it after they received it, whatever they received from you was genuine from you. Yes. Okay. You Without don't, you've never informed fabricated, consent. That's you've never correct. fabricated a document, right? No. Okay. 
And you said it was without your informed consent? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have, I couldn't sign a document saying I'd seen my shares in the state if I had been denied and suppressed them by the attorneys at law. But you did sign the document because it was to save your father from the stress, right? Correct. Okay. Now tell me about this family meeting that you, you reference in here or the family call. What do Does you this have anything to do with the removal of Ted Bernstein as trustee? You're, you're asking to remove Ted Bernstein for so what is the fabrication meeting? of the waiver. So I'm, I'm asking you if I'm the waiver asking him to remove him for fabrication of the waiver. I got a whole laundry list of stuff uh, to remove him for. And we're on the first one, the waiver. Okay. You said, I mean, if you want to go back to the original list, there have been fraud. Okay, and, so the family meeting, documents. I was I was called by my dad about a meeting to discuss uh, the estates, and uh, at that meeting, okay, hold on a second. Let's let me just break it sure. down. Okay, so you called to have a meeting to discuss I didn't the call. estate. My no, dad I, called. I, let's, you were called to a meeting at your father's request to discuss estate matters. Correct. Do you recall the date of the meeting? Well, I think May tenth or something. And it was a conference call, correct? Correct. Now, from May 11th, which is the day before this call. The day before May right, 11th? Right, on May 11th. May 11th, if the call was on May 10th. Oh, May 10th, okay, sorry, on May 9th. Okay. As an example of a bad question, I apologize, I'll strike it. Yeah. If we start on May 9th and go backwards in time, had right. you ever seen your mother's will prior to that call? It's very interesting because my dad, when he called to schedule the meeting, was stunned that I hadn't been sent those documents by Tesher and Spolina. That wasn't my question. And my he question asked was me to get see... those documents, which is why I asked for those documents in the waiver notice. Because he was just as surprised that I hadn't received any notice that he thought I had received from Tesher and Spolina. So prior to May... Prior to May 10th, you had never seen a copy of your mother's will. Correct. And prior to May 10th, you'd never seen a copy of your mother's trust. Correct. And you'd never seen your father's will or your father's trust. Correct. And the will and trust that would have existed at that point would be the 2008 documents. Correct. Allegedly. Allegedly. Had you ever seen any earlier wills or trusts of your parents prior to May yeah, 10th? Yeah, I did. What did you see? Uh, some Proskauer wills and trusts that me and my dad did years ago when we were going to transfer in the I view at stock so that it would avoid growing in our estates and be transferred to my children and his children and grandchildren. There was some point in time when you thought the I view at stock was going to have significant value? Well, I didn't know. Everybody else did. Engineers from leading companies around the world valued it as the holy grail. Did you believe them? Everybody believed him. Wayne Heising, four and a half million you. dollars. Of course, I believed him. Okay, so they, it, let's, let's try it. Okay. If you listen to my questions, my answer, mm -hmm. I think the short answers will help us out both. Mm -hmm. So you believed it was worth a lot of money. I was informed it was worth a lot of money. And you I believed hired top lawyers and, and you top believe what you were told. from around the world. Sure, people invested in it, millions of dollars. And it turns out that the iView stock isn't worthless, correct? No, that's your statement. Who said it's worthless? Well, does iView have any ongoing business activities? I view it is involved in a lot of investigations, state and federal, again, that are ongoing. The patents are suspended at the U.S. Patent Office, and there's been all kinds of things, car bombings of my family, uh, again, fraudulent estate or fraudulent uh, patent applications and improper names done again by attorneys at law. Okay. And you filed a 300-page lawsuit in federal court in Southern, Dis Southern District of New York as a shareholder and on behalf of I view it? Correct. And that was dismissed with prejudice by the judge? No. It was dismissed. I think she uh, did not, if you look at the order, dismiss it with prejudice. And she not only dismissed it with prejudice, but she entered an injunction to prevent you from filing any claim oh, based that's upon that? No. She... <laughs> I earned my wings. Uh, she filed, she said, uh, I have to style the request to open the case back up differently than I have done. 
and she sanctioned you thirty five hundred dollars for yeah. filing in violation. Correct. Did you pay the sanction? No. Because she said if they wanted to collect it, I don't think they ever did. Are you going to pay the sanction? Nobody's ever come to collect it. I don't have any money to pay it, but that's also due to all the okay. things that lawyers have done to my family so since inventing these technologies where, you know, it's uh, alleged that they've stolen them. Right. Other than the time that your father... By the way, did you work for Gunster Yokely at one point? Other than the time that your father... Is, good. Is that... Can you just address that real quick? Other than the time that your father thought there was value in IVU, did he share any trusts or estates with you, documents with you? No. At what point did the iView it business stop functioning on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, around 2000, okay. 2001. So by 2008, your, would your father oh, have... maybe 2000. Fully f quit, well, it's complicated, but probably somewhere in 2002 to three. Okay, long before 2008. Long before 2008. Okay. And your father would not have believed in 2008 that the IV would stock had any value, correct? No. That's, again, a mischaracterization. You're putting words. Word. I don't even know where you come up with that. My dad thought it was worth the holy grail. He was at the meetings. He was one of the, he was the seed investor. He was chairman of the board. He came into my, he basically gave up the rest of his life to get involved in it. But he believed it had a lot of value. In fact, he was funding me for years to keep working and fight and prepare the patent lawsuits and the lawsuits against the lawyers and he supported all that wholeheartedly and paid for it okay. and protected my family for very intricate estate planning work which the fiduciaries have tried to destroy and that being because Ted in fact was alleged to be one of the last people who was in possession of my automobile before a bomb was put in it and it was reported to the FBI. Ted was given the guy's name to call. I'm not sure if he ever did. But Ted appears to be working with quite a few of the defendants in that case as his friends. Uh, my dad, on the other hand, believed in I view it till the day he died because he was there. He saw the inventions. He was at the meetings where leading engineers, for example, from Silicon Graphics, Lockheed, and Intel, confirmed and called it the holy grail worth billions upon billions of dollars in the imaging invention and priceless for the video. And as you know, internet low bandwidth video would be impossible without my inventions. And your inventions are worth maybe trillions of dollars? Yeah. That's what other people have said. You could look at the... How much, what percentage of the iView in stock does your father have? Well, our original agreement was he'd have 30% interest in the companies and patents. Now, we got crammed down by investors, so, you know, the exact amount is going to be debatable. And then if the people who had stock like Jerry Lewin and uh, Proskauer Rose are found to have committed fraud, they'll probably lose their interest, so it would be just a little bit better. Just beyond the scope of our deposition. Well, they I just asked me what the percentage was. I want to know the percentage. I think this whole thing is beyond the scope of the deposition. Well, your question. So I don't know what I view at stock has to do with if Ted's qualified as a fiduciary. Well, I asked really? you. No, I asked you if you'd ever. Yes, my father ever shared. Is, no, his interest is. No. And no. I asked you what you. I asked you a simple question. Did you? Did your father share with you his testamentary documents before May tenth? And you said yes, he did. And then I said when? And you told me the story. And I just. It is important for the. You, you do you leave Ted as, in his role is is, uh, not properly trying to maximize and monetize the value of the IV with stock that your father held? I think he's trying to deny its existence first and then trying to offer it back to me as some way to sign documents and commit fraud like he did. I've alleged that in the extortion filings with the courts and the police. Okay, so what percentage of the IV with stock do you think your father had at the time of his death? I just told you. I asked an answer. It was thirty percent less being crammed down. Okay. Do you know what? Do you know what percent it, it gets to in math? I just told you why it's complicated. Okay. And did your mother own any IVU stock? I believe their interests were held together. Okay. So whatever interest she had would have passed to your father. Yeah, vice versa. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did your father, prior to May tenth, ever tell you anything about his personal financial condition, how much money he had? Sure. Okay, what did he know. tell you? You know, 
it's, it's worth 50 to 100 million dollars. Okay, when did he tell you that? Throughout the years, different times. Okay. When's the last time he told you that? Oh, it's probably right before he died. Before he died, he told you it was worth 50 to 100 yeah. million? Yeah. And what did he promise you you'd be receiving? Well, it was 6 million that my sister had uh, violated a contract for the insurance business. She had also uh, not paid my father on a compensation agreement they had, which led to her being cut out of the estate way back in 2000 before Ted. In the Proskauer plans we just discussed, Pam was cut out right there. Uh, I believe her husband told my father to sue him uh, for not paying on the uh, non-compete agreement they had entered into when he sold the companies. Now my sister stopped paying. I have a we're lifetime. A little bit. We're well, no, we're not. I have a quarter point interest in the uh, arbitrage program that we developed together. That was a contract I had, and my sister failed to pay me on that and my father. I believe at the time, and she sued me, and then I countersued. And this is Pam? Yeah, and I believe that was for $6 million, roughly. So he told me whatever the quarter point interest would shake down to be, that would be left. I believe in a company, Bernstein Realty, Bernstein Family Investments, one of those companies that he was set up that was feeding my family with income, et cetera, for many years. Okay. Did your father ever tell you what his 50 to $100 million was comprised of? Yeah, various companies, holdings, you know, private, personal properties, jewelry, all kinds of things they had. Okay. And he confirmed that to you around May 10th, 2012, or sometime between then and the time I'm of his not, death? I'm not exactly sure, but, but yeah, before he died, yeah. Okay, 50 to 100 million is what he told mm -hmm. you. And what were you supposed to get of the 50 to 100 million? A third. Okay. And you believe that up until the day he died? I believe it now. Okay. So you're supposed to get a th a third of 50 million would be 16 million? Well, now remember that the, you're asking me the value of his estate. With the I view it stock, it could be hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. I mean, these are the most powerful patents in the digital world. They actually are running right now, the video is 92%, according to Cisco, of all digital, all digital transmission using my technologies. You watch TV, 75% of your channels are due to my technology. As, as, the, as the technology, we're going a little bit of far, but you mm -hmm. did it, not me. But so, no, right. the is states, your you asked me what the estate was worth. Is your technology subject to an actual patent that's been issued by the government? Well, they've been suspended pending investigations by the FBI and U.S. Patent Office of fraud on the United States Patent Office. When were they suspended? By the attorneys, 2007 or eight. Okay. So you're not the holder of any patents currently? Not issued patents, pending patents, okay. so suspended pending. Have you brought any patent infringement actions? No. Okay. So. But I will be. <laughs> Just as soon as we get through all the fraud of lawyers. Okay. <laughs> Again, notice it's lawyers committing all these fraudulent acts, changing documents. It was the 50 to 100 million? One of my patent attorneys actually put 90 patents into his own name after meeting me, Ray Joa. Did. Who represented he was with Proskauer at the time. Did any of the 50 to 100 million that you believe your father had consist of IVU? Is that in addition to the 50 to 100 no, million? No, that's an addition. Okay. Was the life insurance concept business any part of the 50 to 100 million that you know about? Life insurance concept? Holt, which one? There's several of them, I believe. Well, Life in, uh, LIC Holdings, Inc. <coughs> Inc or LLC? Inc. Inc. Uh, I believe so. Okay. Do, you know, do you know how much your father viewed that? To be worth? I, you know, I don't, but I saw some documents here that showed he took out like $12 million over two years just before he died. And Ted's been hiding all those records, even though Lick Holdings is listed on the inventory and accountings of Simon, Ted's refusing to turn over those records. So we really, you know, the reason we don't know the real value here, Alan, is because all the accountings have been denied in the trusts and okay. the estates. Let's talk about May 10th. So you, you got a call. So you really your, can't, you know. You got a tell. call that your father wanted to have a meeting. Uh, yeah. Who, who notified you of that? My father. Okay. Did he call you? He did. How many days before the meeting did he call uh, you? A few. Okay. 
And a, 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 there was a conference call that took place on May 10, 2012? Correct. And what was discussed at the conference call? Well, he was considering to stop Ted and Pam's abuse and Lisa and Jill as well, who had come in. Ted and Pam were, it, it, I learned that day, Ted and Pam were cut out of the estate and had been tipped off by Spolino. You didn't know it before that day? I didn't. Before that, you thought I, Pam was cut out because of the. I didn't know that either until okay. I got the documents okay. and saw that. But So I had no idea. I thought that. you knew from Proskauer that Pam would have been cut out. In I said from the Proskauer documents. Okay. So I didn't get those till part of this production. Oh, you didn't even have those until this production? Right. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So your father had never shown you any of his testamentary documents before? Correct. Before he died? Correct. Even we just did. Not before May 10th well, and not between the time then and when he died? He never showed you any of his testamentary documents? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. So the, the conference We did called. documents together at Proskauer, so I, the part about them being cut out, I wasn't informed. Of. Okay. Because you just said earlier from your testimony, I was led to believe that you were saying they were, that you knew she was cut out back then. Now you're saying you I didn't that. say back then. I said okay. I knew from the documents. Don't All mischaracterize right. my statements. So we've got conference call May 2012. You find out for the first time that Ted and Pam are disinherited. Correct. Okay. Did that surprise you? No, not too much. Did it please you? No, not at all. It means you get more money, wouldn't it? I'm not a big money person, Alan, so it okay. doesn't matter to me. All right. Okay. So during that call, what, 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 who talks? I believe everybody talked. Who, who was the primary? Who spoke first and, and was the lead? Was it your father or was it Robert Spleen? I don't recall. Did Robert Spleen speak during the call? Yeah. What did he say? He said uh, we were here to discuss uh, the possibility that Cy was considering altering the estate plans of he and Shirley, uh, if possible, um, Did Simon to your stop the stress that was being caused on him, this duress, by Ted and Pam's anger over their being disinherited and their lineal descendants. And so that basically, and then I learned that the stress was that he was being withheld. Well, up to that point, I thought that Ted, Pam, Lisa, and Jill had stopped seeing my father and precluded their children from seeing my father because of his girlfriend. But it wasn't until the meeting, and I was asked to join that pogrom on my father, but I didn't because um, I thought it was elder abuse, actually, uh, in considering his girlfriend was an Anna Nicole with an interest in the estates, like who cares who he dated, um, since he never cared who they dated. But uh, I then learned at the meeting that Ted and Pam had an ulterior motive that was driving their stress on Simon to force him to make changes to his wills and trusts of he and Shirley, or else he would never see the grandchildren and them again. Did you ever withhold your children from your father and mother? Never. Did you ever enter into an agreement with them where you agreed to allow your mother and father to see the children a specific number of times each year? I did. In exchange for which they would pay you $100,000? Well, that wasn't the whole deal. There was a lot more to the deal. That was deal. part of the deal. That was part of the deal. Okay, you'd move to Florida, they would pay your expenses and pay you $100,000 and you'd have to It was nothing to do with move to Florida. Okay. Um, it was just, that was why they wanted a number of times that they could see him because I was in California, okay. thousands of miles away in a remote location. Actually, I had to flee town after my car was bombed and blew up cars next to it. And so. Your car was bombed in California? No, in Florida. Okay. Well. And then I left immediately thereafter because me and my dad decided that would be best for the safety while he determined A, Ted's involvement in the car bombing, who was involved and tried to negotiate to save is your my life family's on, life. Is your life in jeopardy today? Yes. From whom? Same people. Who are they? The Proskauer Rose, Foley and Lardner, a few other law firms that were involved, and whoever put a bomb in my car. Are any of the judges threatening your life, or do you feel them? No, they're I never said a judge threatened my life ever. No, I'm saying, do you think any of the judges of New York or Florida Supreme Court were involved in the conspiracy? I do, and okay. I've I've levied allegations that have led to the well. What's going on in New York's remarkable, obviously. As you know, I filed a lawsuit. You just mentioned it, and it was 
at the advice of a former disciplinary department member who asked me to file a lawsuit relating to a whistleblower from the New York Supreme Court First Department Disciplinary Committee who came out and blew the whistle that our complaints against lawyers and judges were being destroyed illegally and that people had moved to block our complaints and everything else. My case was legally related. I believe I filed a civil RICO, but I believe the judge docketed it as a criminal RICO and notified the state attorney. Um, okay, so did, did you, on May 10th, 2012, did your father need your permission to change his will? Yes. Why? To change, did he need, well, did he need my permission to change his will? I don't know. That's a legal question. Okay. Close did he ask your permission? Conclusion. Did he ask your permission? Uh, what he asked me permission for was if I, as a beneficiary, if it could be done, would be willing to give up my inheritance that him and his mother had set aside for three of us to share amongst ten grandchildren. Okay. And what did you say? Whatever he wanted me to do. Okay. But then later he said he didn't want to do that, and he couldn't do it. He actually said he couldn't do it legally. And when did he tell you that? Uh, you know, I think when he moved... He moved out of Ted's office a few weeks before he died and started a new business with his secretary's husband, which he invested, I believe, a quarter million dollars, of which 40 had gone in at that time. And he came to that office to work there, which was kind of unbelievable. He was splitting up with Ted. I guess there had been some huge fights that there's witnesses to. I guess it was over either not him not doing the documents or not making the changes, but. He was scared of Ted and believed that Ted had stole money from a guy named William Stansberry and possibly him. And that was maybe, uh, I don't know, two, three months before he died. Okay, so your father says during this call that he wants to leave all of the money to the 10 grandchildren. No, probably. not at all what he said. He said, he said he was considering that in exchange for Ted and Pam stopping their abuse and Lisa and Jill, which okay. never stopped until the day he died, okay. and which is why he never made these changes while he was alive, and they needed all this post-mortem forgery and fraud to help it along. Okay. Lisa, it never happened. Were Lisa and Jill withholding their children from Simon? For a different reason. Ted had recruited everybody to think that Cy's girlfriend was a whore, that his own children came to my house and told me that Ted had caught her stealing to get a breast implants, and so they were concerned that she was, you know, I remember he blamed her for murder the was day my Lisa father and Jill, died. Were Lisa and Jill well, I want to explain. Well, not yes or no? Lisa and Jill were part of withholding their children only based on the girlfriend, not the fact that they had been disinherited because they weren't. Okay. And your father indicated he was considering changing to the 10 grandchildren? Yeah, if he could, if he was thinking about it to stop the abuse. Okay. And did he asked if you had any objection to that, and you said no. Do whatever I would you want, never Dad. object to anything, Alan, that would stop my father from possibly being murdered by stress, okay. by well, his kids. It was disgusting. Then five days later, you signed the document. That I would have signed it six. the day okay. without looking at anything just to say, I don't know what kind of son you are, but that's the kind of son I am. Now, if the court did not require notarization, would, you would have had no objection to your waiver being filed with the court, correct? I would have. What was the objection? That I, I didn't get the documents to affirm the validity of my statements. I never acknowledged receipt of a complete distribution of the share of the estate. So the document was bogus. Spillane and Tesher had agreed they would send me the documents to make my statements on this true before filing it, and they didn't. In fact, they filed it without my approval after my father was dead, using my dead father to file as the PR without notifying the court that he was dead. Look at that September 13th transcript when Colin finds out that size dropping off documents weeks after he's dead. These, these were dropped off at the court, what day? October 24th. I signed it in May. Where was it all those other months? Oh, okay, so it wasn't signed and sent into the court when I signed it. If Lisa, Jill, Ted, and Pam signed waivers on the same day you did and shipped them off to Tesher and Spelina, 
and your father said to you, Elliot, I want to file the waivers from Ted, Pam, Lisa, Jill, and yourself, along with the one I already signed in April, would you have said, okay, Dad, go ahead and do it? Not without looking at the documents and seeing what my interest that I was waiving and knowing what was going on. This was completely in the blind. Even if your father said to you? Even if he said it, and I, he knew that. I mean, I was going to see what my interests were that I was waiving. Otherwise, I'd be signing a false document, which I did, which I explained to you that I did because my father but was even, under grave duress from this assault by his children. But even if he asked you to sign it without looking at the documents, and even if he told you he needed it to cause distress, you wouldn't have done it as a favor to your father? No. I wouldn't have allowed it to be filed. Okay. I did this as a good gesture in the event that he wanted to change it and sent me all the documents as were promised. I just didn't want him to die. That's why I signed it minutes after I got it and sent it in just because I knew he was under so much stress. He was, out, he was actually on my couch crying half the time over what they were doing to him. He was on his psychiatrist's office. They were destroying him right after his wife died. I mean, it's just so pathetic. I can't even believe you're involved in this. Um, when you filled out an indigency petition in connection with this case, you listed that you have zero dependents. What does that have to do with the qualifications of Ted? Okay. You, yeah, I don't have my wife listed dependents. Okay. Do you have dependents? I have three children. Okay. I don't list them. I don't have a tax return. She earns the income, so she's listed them okay. as dependents. Do you file tax returns? I haven't since I don't have any income for a lot of years. So she files an individual tax return when you don't. She does without you. Right. But are they are they in fact your dependents? Yes. Okay. And you purport in this case to represent their interests. I do. Well, no, I don't purport. I do. Okay. Are their interests in conflict with your interests? Well, they're everybody's kids are interests. Ted's example, to, and being a fiduciary, obviously he's got a bigger responsibility here regarding that conflict but every kid now is in conflict with their children due to the fraudulent documents that try to make Ted and Pam's children beneficiaries but Ted's got a real big conflict with his children that you know hasn't been protected for two years what conflict is that you know, the conflict that he and his children might not get a dime in these estates if the judge rules that those documents are bogus and frauded and fraudulent, and Ted's back to the 2008 documents where he and his family are cut out. And Ted's got conflicts with every beneficiary because of that. Me, I do have a conflict with my, my children, and I was advised by Counsel Christine Yate of that very early on when she discovered uh, the conflicts between the kids and the grandkids of Simon and Shirley due to the problems and the things. And so, I turned over my children's representation to Christine, and I represented my pro se to parse the conflict. Now, none of the other children did that. Still, well, some of Christine, them haven't. Why is Christine Yates not involved any longer? Well, they burned. Oh, you really want the answer to that? Okay. Christine Yates was being paid out of my children's trust funds, which were through a trust that was set up 2006, I believe, for my kids for school education, that Spelina and Tesher started to misuse to burn up my family's money while they were cutting me off money from the estates, my inheritances. So they used that money up and she was very concerned that her bill was being paid for by school trust funds. And she said, you know, to even get documents, I think I submitted the letters between her and attorney Mark Garber where they're just so frustrated with Tesher and Spelina A lying to him. She called first, said they said they never heard of the Bernstein family, took weeks to get back to her. So after burning up a huge legal bill just trying to get documents and then getting incomplete records, and then records that had frauded and fraudulent documents in them, she we couldn't afford her anymore. And the estate was denying me counsel, even after our repeated requests that I needed counsel, including for the conflicts created between the children. Isn't it true that you didn't discover the document that Robert Spelina fabricated? I believe he sent it to Christine Yates. Yeah, but you didn't know it was a fabrication at that point, did you? I don't know. I don't recall. Well, you never claimed it was a fabrication before you got a letter from Donald Tesher advising you that Mr. Spelina had fabricated the document. You have a pretty good recollection of other things, and this is kind of an important thing. You, I don't recall. Okay. 
because you claim to have uncovered the, the six waivers, right? I did. Okay. You don't claim to have uncovered the fact that Spelina fabricated the First Amendment to the trust, right? I didn't claim that. Okay. And I think he claimed it to Palm Beach and Sheriff investigators when he was invest okay. as part of an ongoing investigation into him and Ted and you. And you don't have a, you don't know if, if things that were being done by Ted and his counsel were, were what led to that document being uncovered as a fraud. You don't know that, one way or the other. What was the question? You don't have personal knowledge of whether that the, the Spelina fabricated document was uncovered by the actions of Ted and his counsel. No, I have no idea what they're all claiming at this okay, point. Okay, good. Let's talk about the the damages that were caused by these waivers. What the effect of the waivers being fabricated and filed with the court? No, no, the they judge, weren't filed with the court. This document you're showing me was rejected by the court. This document does not exist in the record. Well, that, the court well, that's threw it away. True, it not, is true. Let's not argue. The judge already said it. Well, let's not argue. The document it. is was rejected by the court. Well. So it's not a part of the record anymore. Okay, well. And neither is the fraudulent one. So there are no waivers on record of mine with the court right now. Okay, well, I don't want to debate that point. Well, I know you don't. I just want to ask you a couple questions. Okay. If the waivers, if you hadn't detected the fraud about the waivers, the estate would have been closed. And no, closed. of course not. We were discovering that my father closed the estate while he was dead, all of a sudden we found an April 9th document claiming that my father was delivering a document after he's dead to the court stating he had all the waivers signed by his children prior to his death when we know factually from the record here today that Jill didn't send hers in until after his death. So my dad, I guess, in April was perjuring himself or that document is another fraudulent document used to close the estate of my mother illegally, which I believe is, Alan, why it was reopened by the judge because of these kind of things. Well, let's focus, though, for a second. If the, the estate at one point was closed, correct? Illegally, by but, my father. Now, my brother, but, see, but, when, my bro, when my dad died, my brother alleges to have been the PR. But he's not the guy who closed the estate. Correct. Your brother was not involved in the estate at all. No, no, I didn't say real. that. Don't don't put things in my mouth. I didn't say that. Okay. My well, brother was alleging he was PR the day my dad died. Uh, where did he make that allegation? To us at my dad's house. He told us that Spleen and Tesher had informed him that because he was the oldest, that he was the successor. The successor trustee under your mother's trust. Yeah, because he was the oldest living child. Right, he was a successor then, trustee. He then, said he was the successor trustee under your mother's trust, correct? He said he was the six. He alleged he was the that Spillane and Tesher had informed him because he was the oldest child. He was that he was the successor. I contacted of your mother's trust, correct? That he was the successor trustee, right? On, based on that, correct? And then, at that time, at no, that no, time, I'm not no, finished late, with no, my answer. Let me questions. finish my answer, though. I don't like time, to be cut off in my answer. Well, so at, at that all. time, well, you did. So Ted alleged that, and then I contacted friends of mine who I believe are lawyers. Are you throwing things on? No, sir. I'm oh, okay. to throw a water bottle out. Okay. And I'm letting you finish your answer as long as it takes, and let me know when you're finished. Go okay. Ahead. Um, where were we? Can you read that back? Just like throwing something. At me. Just where I or his question. Sorry. Oh, so I was told, me and my siblings were told that Ted was the successor by Ted and Spillane and Tesher on a call that day because Ted was the oldest. I challenged that statement by calling some of my friends and saying, does that sound right? They said no, they wanted to see documents. I asked for documents. I was refused those documents for God knows months and months and months till Christine finally got some of them. Um, yet when we told them that, they later called back and said, oh, they had discovered documents that, Ted, that said Ted was in there. So we asked to see those and we couldn't get a copy of those right away. We were denied those, told we didn't need them and that that's the way it was, Ted was it. And so they'd be sending us stuff when they got it ready. And months later, I had to get lawyers to go get these documents showing that. But at the time your father died, everyone thought that your mother's estate was closed because you, you had signed no, a waiver. No, 
No, no. We never thought my mother's estate was closed. Well, you signed a waiver in May, right? Yeah, no, it still was, wasn't closed then. So what are you talking about? Well, you signed a waiver in May. Yeah. And you waived any notice of any further proceedings, correct? No. I waived contingent upon getting all the documents okay. and having informed consent. Okay. you got to get it straight, Alan. Because no, you got to get it straight. Okay. okay. Let me get it straight. Okay, good. You, Your waiver is not valid because you wrote on the original waiver some language and sentence. It's not a part something. of the court record. This thing's garbage. You might as well okay. toss it in the trash. It's not a part of the court record. It was kicked out. Not this in the document. It's nowhere found in the clerk's office, that document. It was kicked out of was, the record according to the judge. Okay. It's so not, it's not a part according to the judge. It's not a okay, waiver. Not, You're going to try that argument, but I suggest you go read the October hearings yeah. and you'll find that the judge isn't going to buy that argument. No, I don't want to put words in okay. the judge's mouth. Good. I want to just don't. ask you questions. Yeah. Read the record. So you, when, your mother died, when your father died, you thought your mother's estate was still open? We knew it was. Okay. Because Spleen and Tesher actually said they needed Jill's document to close it. Since they didn't have Did her object? waiver at the time of my dad's death. Which makes it strange that in April he signed a document allegedly stating he had all the waivers from his kids. Now when Ted told Prior to the main meeting, when he we didn't even have waivers. So on April 9th on a document a petition for discharge or whatever it is waiver that Judge Colum points out in the September 13th hearing, we find that Cy in April says that he had all the waivers of his children, and we hadn't even been sent to him yet in April, since this document wasn't sent to me till after May 10th, Alan. Now when you're- And that's supposedly a signed document of my father's too that was delivered by my father to the court after he was dead by my father acting as the PR when he was dead, which again is why Judge Colon goes back to the Miranda issues. When you found out, when Ted said, I'm, I'm the oldest, so I'm going, or Tesher and Selenium told me I'm the oldest, so I'm going to be taking over Dad's role, did that bother you? I, I wanted to see proof of it. What, and you, so it bothered me that I had no proof, and it bothered me when I called other people, and they said, well, you got to see the documents to see if being the oldest would qualify him, or what the documents say, get a copy, shoot it over to us, well, I couldn't do that. They refused, that time, suppressed, and denied the documents. Okay. At that time, did you think Ted would make a good candidate? No. Okay. He's been bankrupt. He's had serious problems. He's, you know, he's a train wreck of, the, I don't think he even graduated college. So whether you saw the documents or you didn't see the documents, you, you didn't want Ted to be the, the successor to your father? I didn't say that. I said without seeing the documents, I didn't want anybody to be the successor, and I didn't and once you Buy saw documents it. that named Ted, you didn't want him to be the successor. I didn't see those reason. for a long time, and by that time, Ted had already started breaching so many duties that it was not even funny. Now, if the waivers had been filed and accepted by the court and the estate had been closed, you'd be in the same position, right? You're not a beneficiary of your mother's estate. You don't even claim to be a beneficiary of your mother's estate, do you? I did. I said I'm a personal property beneficiary. Well, of what personal property? Of whatever's in the will that says it's left to their kids. Have you received the personal property you're no. supposed to receive? I haven't received anything. What personal property is, is, does the will say you're supposed to get? Well, we don't know because none of the codiciles, attachments, and addendums have been sent to any of the beneficiaries. Well, you've received So we don't even know. And her inventory has been gravely mischaracterized, and it's challenged because there's missing millions of dollars of furniture or jewelry and other okay. Bentley that was fully paid for. All kinds of things right. went disappearing. There was a so we believe that that inventory is fraudulent. We've challenged it. We've stated that to the court. Okay, but if there was millions of dollars worth of jewelry and a Bentley and anything else in your mother's name when she died, it would have gone into your father. That's incorrect, Ellen. First, it would have gone on to her inventory, and then it would have transferred. Okay. That way, we would have a clear record. But somehow, all the jewelry goes disappearing, and now it's the subject of a Palm Beach County Sheriff's report. Right, but you don't know anything about what's in your mother's estate because you, Elliot Bernstein, expressly acknowledged that you 
were aware that you had a right to a final accounting, but you waived the final accounting and the service of a final or other accounting by the personal representative. Wrong. Isn't that Bail true? in that document was signed again under the duress that my father might die okay. but if, if it, I didn't get that signed. It, it wasn't under But duress. I wasn't given any of the information in there to make informed consent on the document. Right, but if there wasn't duress. Okay, if, if, if. Right. Um, I don't work in a world of if, well, Alan. And if, if the court's going to, if, if. Come if on, let's work on the facts. If this wasn't under duress, then you, you knew you were giving up your right to an inventory and an If I had seen your everything and Spillane and Tesher had sent me okay. all the documents, yeah, maybe that would have made this a legitimate document. But even then, Alan, it's still garbage because the court kicked it out of the record. Okay. And then the one that came back in, as you know, was fraudulently notarized and forged. And you got to wonder if everything's on the up and up, what's all this forge and fraud going on on documents to make changes that all benefit Ted by Ted's counsel? If you, if you could have, if you could <laughs> advise the court what it should do with the assets, what do you want to see happen with, with the assets in the estate? Well, I'd like the court to freeze everything, remove Ted, and have forensic accounting coming in and to look at it. And split it up one third to you, one third to Lisa, one third to Joe. I don't know yet. Those are legal conclusions. I'll you know, wait for the judge to determine those things after we have a chance to review the evidence. Meaning that but we don't that, know what assets there are, Alan, no, no. because the trustees and fiduciaries have hidden all the records of the trust corpus, of the trust res, and all the estate uh, corpuses. So, Without any accountings, again, we're in that black hole of what's there. So you talk about all the assets, but you're unwilling as fiduciaries to share what the assets are for now two years. It's a joke. It's criminal. Okay. And what assets do you think exist in the Shirley estate that haven't Who already knows? been? Can I finish the question? Yeah, that haven't already what? Been taken by your father while he was alive. We don't know. Right, and, and we gave up your right to know because you signed the waiver. No. Right? Okay. No, Next. nice. Let's yeah. miss, stop mischaracterizing okay. and putting things in the record. I get you're trying to continue this fraud, and, and I know your involvement as a respondent and a defendant in these matters. By the way, did you tell your insurance company that you're a respondent and a defendant? Are they allowing you to conduct this? Why do you think I'm a respondent in the case? Because I've served you petitions with you as a respondent for your involvement in the perpetration of the frauds. Okay. What are the petitions, what relief did the petition seek? All kinds. I filed two years worth okay. with lots of requests for your removals and other things. Okay. And you moved to disqualify me? That was denied? It was. Okay. Now, but I never... But Judge Cullen just asked you the other day in court Sorry. if you had filed a responsive pleading and you stated no and he made you aware that on the record you're a respondent both personally and professionally. Which again is why I think you need counsel here and why I think you're conflicted and I'm going to be filing further to remove you for these kind of acts. In fact, you even stated your concern to the court that you can't represent on at the hearing on the 24th because you're a, a counter defendant who's been served process by the marshal services. Right. That's, that's your goal for suing me, right? So that no, I get out of the case? No, not at all. No, my goal is to put you in prison for aiding and abetting the fraudulent acts of the counsel that brought you in here, Tesher and Spillino. Okay. Believe me. That's, that's your goal. my. Yes. Okay. You don't want money. You just want to be no, in jail. Yeah, because what you've done to my to family, correct? To money. my parents. Okay. You. Money's not important to you. It's, it's very irrelevant right. in my okay. grander scheme of things. Okay, fine. So you, as far as what, if the judge, if everyone agree, if I could get everybody. If, if I'm not doing well, speculatory questions. Question? No, not speculatory. I'm if, not going to speculate if, on if, if. If everyone would ask the judge to give you one third of everything that exists and one third of everything that's found after a full accounting, would that be enough for you to accept the documents that your mother and father drafted? When, which ones? Anyone. Which ones they drafted? Well, you said you, if you go back to the 2008 documents, which I think are the ones you think are valid, because you don't think the 2012 document was notarized properly under the. I don't think they're valid until I see the originals, okay. but you, which you, are you, being suppressed and denied by the fiduciaries for now two okay. years from me. You, you're certain that the 2012 documents are invalid because Lindsay Baxley didn't properly notarize them. No, correct? there's other problems with them, but. But isn't that one problem? They're that being one, investigated. Is that one problem enough? To to invalidate no, them? I don't know. I, that's a legal conclusion. Okay. So they still might, even though she didn't check the box, they still might be valid. And you have other reasons why they, they might should. be. Right. Okay. But let's say the 2012 documents are determined to be not effective. Right. Then we'd go back to 
maybe the 2008 documents, if they're determined after forensic analysis, to be genuine and real, correct? Well, the problem is, the Alan, that two, the 2012 documents only could be used for my father's estate. My mother's trust was irre irrevocable the day she died. I think you know that. The beneficiary class was established, and the only beneficiaries in there that I can find are the Elliot Lease and Jill family trusts. Okay. What about the fact that your father had a power of appointment? The only, that only allows him to change the shares between the beneficiaries of Shirley's trust, which is Elliot Lisa and Jill's family trust. Okay. Could he have left it all to Lisa uh, under the power of appointment? You know, under very special circumstances, maybe she was in a coma and dying and needed the money. You know, I, there what are exceptions, I believe. Again, it's decided legal to do it? Could conclusion. He, could he have exercised the power of appointment? favor for anybody he chose as long as it was one of yours or Lisa or Jill's lineal descendants or their spouses? As long, I'm not sure about the lineal descendants, as long as it was uh, legal. Isn't know. it true he could have left all the money to Jeff Friedstein if he wanted to? I don't believe so. Or all the money to Carly? Nope, I don't believe so. Okay. So if you roll back the clock to 2008 though, you're, you're going to get a third under the 2008 documents, right? If Simon My doesn't family. exercise his... Yes. Well, if Simon doesn't exercise his power of appointment, and if there's never a 2012 document, then under Shirley's documents, her trust, you would get one third to yourself, Elliot Bernstein, correct? No, so I believe the Elliot Bernstein family trust. Okay. Of which you'd be the primary and beneficiary that was opened, during I believe, your life. On the same day that they allegedly signed their 2008 documents, there were trusts open for the three proper beneficiaries, Elliot Lee and Jill family trust. Okay. So, if, every, if everybody, not just Ted, but all four other children and all ten grandchildren agreed that you could have one-third of the money into your family trust, would, would you accept that? I don't think it's up to them. I, 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 don't, I, I think this is up to, like you said, finding the truth of what's in the documents, what was forged, who are the proper beneficiaries, and distributing it fairly that way. I do believe that the biggest problem we have is these documents led to the estates being illegally seized, the dominion and control over them by Ted and his lawyers, who then dummied up a lot of documents and started ripping off estate assets and looting the estate in a variety of scams to deny and then hid the accountings, hid the documents, hid all that. And that is the problem here, Alan, not who the beneficiaries are right. yet. While your father was alive, he never showed you any of his documents and never gave you any accounting, correct? Not that I recall. Okay. Now, oh, he did. It, I thought he said he did an accounting and inventory of the estates and trusts, but then he thought Spolina had filed those things. That's your, your father? I, yeah, I thought, okay. I'm pretty sure he said that. that and he, does it bother you that in his And he said that all those things were listed in codiciles, all kinds of jewelry that was given to my wife, properties that were transferred to other people, was all supposed to be part of attachments, which appear all to be missing, even though the documents refer to them. Does it surprise you that in his 2012 trust, he indicates that you shall be deemed to have predeceased him? Yeah. As he's adequately provided for you during his yeah. lifetime? Yeah. Yeah. Does that bother you that he said that? Yeah. Okay. And? I don't believe he said that. I believe that's a forged document. See, right. again, you keep trying to put it in the record as a valid document. We have no idea. You didn't even bring the originals here today. That's kind of bizarre. Now, the you want people to attest to documents, but you're afraid to bring the originals. What's the problem? Can I come inspect them today? The um, you're refusing to answer. Okay, let the record speak. Okay, well, I'll say I have no originals of any documents in my possession. So Does your client? Give you Does your client? The, um, Does your client? Does your client have the originals? Let it, let the record re state he's refusing to answer it. Well, I'm not refusing to answer it. Oh, what was your answer? I didn't get it. Well, the, Does your client have the originals of what? Of the Simon Trust, the Shirley Trust, and the Shirley Will. Ted does not have the original of the Simon Trust or the original of the Simon Will. I'm just, sorry, strike that. He does not have the original of the Simon will or the Shirley will, and I do not believe he has the originals of either trust. 
and he's operating without requesting those as a fiduciary? Oh, I didn't he didn't think it's important to see the documents, especially when there's been forgery and fraud? Okay. You've, the only thing Okay, that whatever. I, I'll take that on the record. The forgery and fraud is, is six waivers. And at first no, amendment the Alan, there's also yeah. wills and trusts that well, are look are fraudulent and are being okay. investigated at this right. moment. Okay. We're going to do forensics on it. We're going to get pipe hitting on it. And we're going to find out just how many of these documents. And I can't believe you just stated on the record that the trustee is operating without the original documents. I didn't, I didn't say that. You just said Ted doesn't possess the original wills and trusts of Shirley and Simon. Can you read that back for the record for me, please? No. Please? So, why not? I'm asking her to read back. Could you read that back for the record, please? No. So, um, well, well, no. What else she, is said, Why um, can't she read that? Why are you denying the court reporter reading me back the record? I'm allowed to ask her to read back the record. I've already told you that Ted does I don't not care have what the original. You Could you please read me back the record on that? Simon or Shirley in his possession? I've you're you you're going to tell her not to read back the record to me of your statement? Did you not say that Ted did not have the original documents of the Shirley Trust, Simon Trust, Shirley Will, Simon Will? I, I, it's on the record what I said. There's no reason to have it read back. Okay, we let the record reflect well, as being let's uncooperative. Do this. Oh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go off the video record. While we're off the video record, the court reporter can read you that, and we're going to take a short break. Go ahead. 103, we're off record. We're getting back on record. It's 113. Thank you. Do you want the court reporter to read something for you on the record? Yeah, if you want to read it back now. I object, but to, to, to get the thing moving, I'll allow it to happen. Mr. Rose has um, made this statement. Ted does not have the original of the Simon Trust or the original of the Simon Will. Sorry, strike that. Does not have the original of the Simon Will, surely will, and I do not believe he has the original of either trust. Okay, thank you. Does that reflect your prior statement? Was Ted involved, do you believe, in fabricating 2012 estate documents? I believe that. Do you have any proof of that? Not yet. What did Ted do to breach his fiduciary duty in the Shirley Trust while he was the trustee of the Shirley Trust? Well, he hasn't sent out accountings. He's failed to send the documents. He's failed to allow inspection of the documents. Um, he's advanced fraudulent schemes to benefit his family at the expense of the true and proper beneficiaries. He continues to try with you now, uh, after Spolina admitted to the police that the beneficiaries of Shirley's trust couldn't be changed from Elliot Lee and Jill, <laughs> to trying to get his children into that trust at you know whatever costs. Even though he's been advised it's improper, the distributions he made, oh, he also took distributions illegally. He also signed a tax document uh, as the PR prior to being issued his letters uh, and prior to actually making any proper notification under the probate code to the beneficiaries that he was the PR other than them alleging that to us. When challenged, he's failed to produce the documents. <laughs> He's basically violated most of the trust and probate code, as I've told you before. I put it in pleadings. It's all pretty much there in the court record. Have you been a cooperative beneficiary, cooperating with Ted in his efforts to administer the trusts or estates? I don't think he's ever asked me to cooperate in anything. Have you been helpful? Sure, I uncovered the fraud on their father and that his, their father's signature was fraudulent and forged. And, you know, I, I would assume that added a lot of value to the estate. Got rid of the trust, uh, the, his counsel, well, several of them now. Uh, you're the last guy standing, as I said repeatedly. I can't understand how, but you're a brave guy. Uh, I believe I've tried to cooperate with Ted, but he refuses to respond to anything. He avoids all kinds of communications. He's been about the worst trustee or PR I've ever heard of in my life. If I withdrew and Ted got new counsel, would you seek to remove his new counsel? If they were advancing the same positions that we're taking, that is, that the trust needs to be construed, that under the view of many experts, Simon had the power to split the money among 10 grandchildren? No, I, I'm, you're involved because you were directly tied to the people who advanced these frauds and committed these frauds. You were brought in by them, and you're continuing to do that knowing that this is improper. 
uh, the lawyer who drafted the document said it can't be done, but you're now trying to propose some new construction of an irrevocable trust to change the beneficiaries to fit the fraud that Ted already committed by taking distributions against the advice of counsel knowingly, illegally. Who brought me in? I believe Ted and Spalina and Tesher. Where do you get those facts from? I figured somebody brought you into the Stansbury case and the estates and trusts. You're acting as Ted's counsel, so I figured he, he did. And you know, that's I believe through Roberts or something. I don't I don't know exactly how you know Ted, but are you rooting for Bill Stansbury to win his claim against the estate? Well, you know, I've looked at his claim, and I believe that you know from the from the documents I've looked at, it looks pretty much like. Uh, Ted ripped off Bill Stansbury. Like I told you, there's a long laundry list of people that accused Ted of taking commissions. I don't know how many lawsuits he's in. He's just in one with Phoenix Life where he was alleged to have submitted fraudulent, dummied up financials on people, leading to a huge rescission that's costing Mr. Stansbury money, I believe, uh, due to the fact that they were insuring people without insurable interests. Now, do you believe your father was an honest man? Yeah. Would your father have committed a fraud against Bill Stansberry? No. Do you know why Bill Stansberry is suing only one person in his lawsuit and the person he's suing is your father for That's fraud? That's false. He's suing Ted. That's why Ted's further conflicted. He's suing Ted. You're not aware that the lawsuit that Bill Stansberry filed against Ted, the companies, and your mother's trust have been dismissed with prejudice and are not being pursued anymore. Well, and the only people he's suing now are your father's estate for fraud well, I'm and, your, and your real estate company, that not that you own, but that you, you live in their house called Bernstein Family Realty. I believe that Bill sued Ted and my father, so not just one person. And I believe the settlement that Ted did acting on behalf of my mother's estate or trust, whatever you just said, was improper because of the conflict that Ted was a defendant in the lawsuit and negotiating as the trustee PR of my mother's stuff. So it seems very likely that Ted would have had incentive to settle up and get out of it personally and leave the estate strapped with his things that Bill mainly alleges in his complaint were done by Ted. Most of the fraudulent acts are done by Ted. Well, how about, not most of them, but do you believe there are any fraudulent acts that were committed by Simon Bernstein against Bill Stansberry? No. And you're not, as you sit here today, you're not aware that the only claim that left in that case is the claim by Bill Stansberry that your father defrauded him. That's not true. Okay. And did you, have you been cooperative and helpful with Bill Stansberry sharing information to help him get involved in the estate litigation? Yep. And you've been helpful to Bill Stansberry in his efforts to go to Illinois and seek to recover the insurance policy? Yep. Now, do you think it's a good idea and it's, it's beneficial to the Bernstein family? That would be the Simon and Shirley Bernstein family, all the children and the grandchildren, whoever the beneficiaries. Do you think it's beneficial that Stansberry has to pay the expenses of the Illinois litigation? That Stansberry has to pay the expenses of the Illinois litigation? I never thought it was fair. I thought the people who have caused these problems should be, but uh, and the estate should be, since it's a benefit to the estate. But I believe because Ted who's supposed to be protecting the beneficiaries of the estates and trusts, uh, was objecting to the estates and trusts getting counsel, the estates getting counsel, the estate assignment, uh, in his, because you see, Ted's conflicted in that case too. Ted's acting as trustee of a lost trust that he claims he never saw, that he has no legal valid copy of, but yet he claims to be trustee. Now that's after Robert Spolino, Okay. filed an insurance claim. Well, you asked me about the insurance, right? No, but you know what? I'm going to have to cut you off there. Oh, okay. I, Are we done? You're going far afield. Are we done? Oh, I was answering the question, so no, let the Who's the personal know. representative? I was interrupted in Who's the personal the representative question. of the estate of Simon Bernstein? Who, who's the personal representative today? Yeah. Under which document? Uh, under the 2012 document? No, who's the... the, the under in, in, Brian O'Connell okay. is... Has Ted ever been the personal representative of the estate of Simon Bernstein? Not that I know of. Isn't the person that would seek to recover the insurance policy someone doing that on behalf of the estate, either a curator or well, an administrator? Is, yeah, of okay. course. Now, here, that's a great question, Al. Okay. Um, the bottom line is you would have expected that the minute 
the personal representative found out a fraudulent insurance claim was filed that got denied, he would have called in the troops and gone into Ted's. Oh, and I believe Ted's. But who, who cares? It's all. The, 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 oh no, the no, no! This is, is very now. important. No, the estate. Tesser is... and Spolina. Well, uh, now the estate that we got rid of Ted's counsel and friends. No. Is now represented because we've had to spend a fortune to get the court to approve that somebody from the estate go there because Tesher and Spolina, who, who, who were part of the fraud, and in fact, in the estates and everybody involved, no. How and much Ted, a fortune and counsel, everybody. Tesher and Spolina, good Jesus, Alan. Look at the way, we, if we had all the records, the billing records, again, those are being secreted, secreted from us too. But the bottom line is, Tesher and Spolina filed a fraudulent claim to move an estate asset out of the estate into their own trust account. So they dummied up an insurance claim and Robert Spolina signed it saying he was the trustee of a lost trust he claims never to have seen. That claim was denied by the carrier. Ted then went and filed a breach of contract lawsuit even though the carrier told him to file a West Palm, get a West Palm Beach court order. Ted then filed a lawsuit didn't notify me. Uh, the insurance company, in their counter complaint, notified me that a lawsuit had been instigated for the policy, um, that I'm supposed to be a beneficiary of, which we've seen no evidence of. And so Tesher and Spolina were deep in trouble when the insurance company rejected their fraudulent claim. Then Ted went and filed a breach of contract suit for their failure to pay a fraudulent claim. And then why Spillane and Tesher didn't want counsel for the estate was obviously they knew they'd get busted if a lawyer went in there and represented the estate's interest in the policy. So they blocked that for months and months. Ted filed things in the Illinois federal court to block the estate beneficiaries. Mr. Morrissey came into the court, as you'll recall, and the judge even said to him, what are you doing trying to block the estate from getting counsel if the estate beneficiaries are your clients? the Ted and Pam's kids. Well, how could you, and he didn't even know it. Then he, well, I can't remember, he double talked or triple talked. But the, the question of why the estate didn't have counsel is because the estate personal representatives were involved in fraudulent acts trying to steal assets out the back door. The last thing they were going to do is get counsel to investigate them, which is part of the reason Ted's breaches. He is not going to give documents that could incriminate him. He is not going to get lawyers for beneficiaries who need it because it could lead to him going to prison along with you, Al. And so, look, that's the real problem here. These are the fiduciary violations you asked about. That's why there was no counsel. Now, Judge Colin, after learning of all that, and believe me, it took a lot of money and time and effort for us to get it to that position, realized that the estate beneficiaries weren't protected. Bill Stansbury was concerned as well. Remember, he was named in the 2008 documents of Simon as the successor trustee and PR until the 2012 documents replaced him. And what's really interesting about that, Al, is that Don Tesher said they were mirror trusts and wills in his uh, deposition you took. And if they were mirrored, I was wondering, it looks awful suspicious that Cy named Bill Stansbury instead of his oldest son as the PR and, and trustee, and surely would have named Simon and then Ted <laughs> when her relationship was worse with him. Do you agree it's a good thing that the estate is now represented by counsel in Illinois? Yes. And it's a good thing that Stansbury's paying for that and it's not at any cost to the estate. Well, he's going to build the estate for it at the end, obviously. But we all know who's paying for these legal bills, you guys. But if he loses, if yeah, Stansbury loses, it's on his own nickel, right? I, I believe so. Okay. That doesn't That's mean he a, can't sue you for it. Sue so who for it? The lawyers involved in this whole fraud, you included. Well, no, I think the deal is Bill Stansbury is advancing the cost of the litigation, all the litigation in Illinois, and if if it's a loser, which everyone other than you and Bill Stansbury thinks, then he's the one who bears all those costs. Like Agreed? I said, he, he might be able to sue you then. Okay. If he does have to pay those costs, which I, he probably will. Are you aware that he is paying them now every month? Uh, 
I don't know what he's doing. I, I don't keep track of his checkbook. And if you, in, in connection with what's going on in Illinois, because he thought it was a fraud, you, you turned down a proposal or settlement that would have given you one-fifth of the money that's in the insurance policy, correct? Well, there is no policy. So far, nobody's produced a valid contract. So Ted's filed a breach of contract lawsuit without the contract. I'm talking about the policy itself. The policy itself, Ted does not have a copy of. The insurance company's already put the money no. in the registry of the court. Well, that they might have done, but they still don't have a contract, and they haven't been able to find a valid contract of Simon's yet. Okay. Which I mean, looks it, like more fraud. But you don't want one-fifth of that money for yourself? Not if it belongs in the estate where the where either me, Lisa, and Jill, or ten grandchildren get okay. it. But you definitely don't. Ted who and Pam, who were cut out, shouldn't be getting anything. And that's clear as day. Now, here's the that's biggest the problem. That they're getting here's, some of the insurance here's money? The, yeah, exactly. Instead of either their children or other people. Uh, and trying to steal the policy out the back door through a complicated, sophisticated fraud that we're just getting into. Like I told you, we're, we've knocked on the federal doors. We're at a federal court. We've got counsel finally for the estate. They're pretty confused about what's going on, too. And it looks like we're just in a, a, another thing where Ted and his sister, who are cut out, are trying to steal assets to benefit themselves, okay. which puts him in conflict with the estate and trust beneficiaries again. Well, there's no conflict because the estate's being represented by counsel in Illinois, and it's well, there has its been, cause. and there's a conflict of Ted trying to oppose actions of the estates that would have got the the benefits. How about the sale of assets? Is Ted? Uh as trustee of the Shirley Trust, sold any assets? Well, I only know of a condominium. Okay, and was there anything wrong signed, with the sale of the condominium? Hell yeah. What well, was wrong with the sale we'll of the condominium? Him, we asked him not to sell it. Why? We told him we had suspicions that things were fraudulent. And what was fraudulent? Documents and records. Or Whatever for, documents were fraudulent, don't you still own a condo you have to sell and liquidate? No, meaning we don't, I don't and have never believed Ted is legally the PR. At that time, he wasn't given his letters by Judge Colin. We're not talking about so the PR. He, the, the, well, that's the, the, who the sold the estate? condo. No, it's not. Oh, he signed tax forms for the condominium sale as the PR executor. In fact, he signed one that well, says he was the executor in, a le in, in 2011 before my dad died. Okay, well. <laughs> Again, that looks like another fraudulent document here. Okay, this is my question to you. Yeah. There's a condo your mother owned. Yeah. Do you know where it was? Yeah. You ever been there? Yeah. Really? Yeah. How many times? Hundreds. Okay. How much do you think it was worth? Uh, I believe my dad had it listed for $3.2 million one month before he died. Okay. How much do you think it was worth on the day your father died? $3.2 million or more. How much do you think it was worth on the day it was sold? $3.2 million. Have you consulted with any real estate experts? I have. Okay. Who? Uh, Crystal Cox was one who first looked at it. Okay. Who's Miss Cox? She's a real estate expert. And she in Florida? Uh, I don't know where she was at the time. She's all over the place. I mean, she a Florida real estate expert? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Montana, I think, is where she practiced. Is this the woman who's like a blogger and you send her stuff and she publishes really bad stuff about everybody in the case? Does this have to do with the removal of Ted? His qualification. You just mentioned but yes, Crystal Cox. I do give Crystal Cox as a reporter information about the case. Plus, she gets her own information. She's contacted police departments okay. and everything else, gets her own stuff. She's an investigative blogger. You give her information about the claims that are made by you and your children against other people? I give her any public documents that I want to give her. Okay. And she says really bad things about people like Tesher and Spelina and Ted and. Ben Brown and I don't John think Van she's Gowski. ever said a word about Ben Brown ever no. bad. No. You don't think she one time blogged what's up with Ben Brown, the ethics of Ben Brown? She might have questioned it. I don't I I, I never seen that actually, but you don't think she refers to him as Benny Boy? She might. You don't study her blogs? I don't. You, that's not part of your daily activity to read not her blogs. Close. And, you, and you didn't read where I'm she busy wrote just studying how much your fraud. Just how much <laughs> conflict of interest does Benny Boy have in all this? You don't remember that she wrote that? No, I've never seen that. How does that help put any money into anyone, any of the beneficiaries? To what me? does this have to do with the qualifications of Ted for the September 24th hearing? As his being a qualified fiduciary? Yeah. Anything? Yeah, has a lot to do what? with it. So what? How does what? your emailing? Because otherwise I'm going to object that it's not relevant. This is your fishing expedition. So. And, you know, what? 
How is that she's help? A blogger. She does what she wants. She uh, takes information. She gets information from me, her sources, police departments, how does all that kinds help, of people. How does that help put money into the beneficiary's hands? I don't understand the question. Well, the goal of an estate is to close the estate and distribute money to beneficiaries. How does your communicating with her advance well, that Well, she's cause? helping uncover and, and expose the fraud. What she's fraud? an investigative blogger. What so. fraud has she uncovered? Well, she's helped in uncovering some of the real estate fraud. The fact that Ted signed documents as the PR of the estate while he wasn't issued letters by the court. And it, the document alleges that he was PR in 2011 when my dad was still alive, which makes it even more fraudulent. She's picked up on a lot of good stuff reviewing the documents. Are you and Crystal Cox involved in a business? No. Have you ever been involved in any businesses? No. Have you ever had received asset transfers from her? No. Oh, asset transfer, I think she put some blogs in my name at one point. Okay. I loaned her a few hundred dollars when she was, okay. when a judgment was awarded the, against her. The two but of that you judgment, as you know, was just lifted. The two of you worked together in, to uh, harass people on the internet? Ellen, I find that to be an abusive comment. I don't think, you better have a lot of backup for those kind of comments or else I'm gonna be suing you for slander and defamation. Are you saying that you have some information of abusing people? We haven't abused anybody. What Crystal Cox has done is exposed your frauds, your Tesher, Ted's frauds. She's exposing them every day against you. Okay, and you're working closely with her to help her do that? I'm, I'm working with an investigative reporter, yeah. Okay, what kind of knowledge and training and experience does she have in Florida real estate? I don't know. Ask her. Other than. Crystal Cox, do you have any, did you consult with any other real estate professionals about the value of the condo? Uh, no. Uh, I know that Cy listed it at 3.2 million after his discussions with Nestler Paletto on the value of the real estate one month prior to his death. Right. And that's also the Simon who thought iView was worth hundreds of millions of dollars or billions or trillions. Yeah. Okay. Same Simon. All right. Now, there's another house that's listed for sale in St. Andrew's Country Club, the Lion's Head address. Are you familiar with that property? I am. And do you have any opinion of the value of that property? Oh, my dad had that listed a month before he died, I think at three million four fifty. Okay. Have you recently contacted? And that was after consulting with Nestler Paletto on the value of the state and the listing. Have you recently contacted Nestler Paletto? I have. Did you advise them that there was going to be litigation with that property, no matter who bought I it? I told them there was pending litigation in the estates and trusts and all the fraud that's being uncovered and that they shouldn't really do anything yet at this time. Okay. So you advised them not to sell the property? because I advised them to seek counsel and make sure what they were doing with Ted was proper in light of all the things going on. Okay. And you suggested and that, that there were actions in the courts, and which you told them there weren't, even though there were. There's petitions filed in both the states and that involves the states in dross. So I thought that was you lying to him, trying to rush a sale. In fact, it was right after Ted was denied becoming the PR of Simon's estate that he rushed to lower the price again. I think he's 50% lower already than the price that my father had it a month before he died. He sold the condo at 50% discount. They, these are self-dealing transactions where we believe that Ted is doing self-dealing transactions illegally. Have you ever seen an appraisal for the condo? Uh, no. Have you ever seen an appraisal for Lion's Head? Nope. We weren't given anything by the fiduciary. So before he sold it, he didn't provide the fiduciaries any information. He was advised not to by the beneficiaries that we wanted to cede the, the deeds to our children first. And he just ran across knowing that documents were forged and the house was on fire and getting petitions where there was forged documents and rushing to sell assets in fire sale discounts as if he had to get that money one way or the other. Did you tell Nestler and Paletto that if somebody bought the Lion's Head property, they would be sued? I can't recall. Did you tell them there would be litigation after the sale? I said there could be litigation. Yeah, did, you tell them that, did you tell them that they should tell anybody who's going to look at buying the house? I said that they should have informed, no, that there was litigation okay. ongoing and that the sale might be improper to check all the records. I did. I didn't want them to get in further trouble. It looks like Ted delisted them as the real estate agent days before he sold the condo 
and then I guess we just found out from some more investigation that they're also getting commission, but we think that the second person getting commission might very well uh, be related to Ted in some way, and that's why they were put on there, which would be even further self-dealing. And so you, you don't so think these are the reasons Ted's not qualified. It's just endless. You want to get to hundreds of them. Okay. Well, you don't think it, you don't think it's a good idea to liquidate the property in St. Andrews. At fifty percent less than what they're worth. Are you insane? No. Okay. No. How about at appraised value? Would it be okay to, li to liquidate him at appraised value? It depends value? on who does the appraisal. Already we've got questions on the people Ted brought in to appraise jewelry and stuff. And, and okay. that, yeah. Did you ever ask Ben Brown to remove Ben, to remove Ted, or to be involved in a proceeding to remove Ted as PR and trustee? Yeah. What did Ben Brown say to that? I don't think he replied. I think Peter Feeben asked, asked, asked them. Okay. And he didn't, he, he, he didn't agree to do it? I don't know. Did you, have you asked Bill, Brian O'Connell to try to remove Ted? I know Peter has. Okay, what did Brian O'Connell tell Peter? I think Brian O'Connell is still reviewing it. Okay. How often do you speak to Peter? Mm -hmm. Occasionally. Okay, has Peter ever given you legal advice? No. Did you ask Bill Stansberry to help you remove Ted? No, he was working on it himself. He's got issues with Ted, too, as a creditor, when he found out Ted was trying to hide assets from a creditor. How many lawsuits have you filed against, other than I view it, have you had other lawsuits against anyone in your life? Yeah, I countersued my sister Pam and her husband. Okay. Have you ever sued AT&T? No. You don't have a lawsuit against AT&T? No. Okay. And your I view it, you sued for $13 trillion? Uh, I think it's a trillion dollars for 13 counts. Okay. And do you think so the company is successful? What do you think the company is worth? Like I said, it's been called the Holy Grail priceless, where it's, you know, it's running 96% or 92% of internet transmission at the moment. You know, start figuring out some royalty on that for every minute, and you're talking a lot of money. Okay. How many bar complaints have you filed against lawyers? Which state? Anywhere. Uh, well, New York, you understand I filed about uh, three or four. Uh, they were denied, and then we uncovered that Proskauer Rose had actually handled the complaints against themselves. Stephen Crane, the former president of the New York State Bar, was ordered for investigation, along with Kenneth Rubenstein and Raymond Joa and Thomas Cahill, first department disciplinary chief counsel, who subsequently resigned amidst what's going on in the whistleblower case and our cases against him. So those are still radioactive is what I would call them. They've led to a shakedown in New York. We're about to come back to Florida in a minute. By the way, in Florida, it went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, which didn't look at it. But we also discovered Proskauer partners handling their complaints illegally. Okay. Now I'm just working on one state at a time bringing the house down on corrupt lawyers like the Rosting guys and all these other people. These lawyers that you think and said to me are above the law and can't be sued actually can be sued and put in prison as you're learning. And you know you might take a look that Proskauer just recently lost at the Supreme Court to try to say that they aren't responsible for the entire damages of the Allen Stanford Ponzi scheme, which it appears they helped orchestrate. So slowly, Allen, it's coming apart. But yes, I filed a series of bar complaints against the attorneys I allege stole my patents, put them in their names. Like I told you, my patent attorney has 90 patents after meeting me. Right. Have any of your bar complaints been resulted in anyone being disciplined? Yeah, they were ordered for investigation. The investigation got derailed. We're just learning about that corruption. That's what the whistleblower from the inside is brought out in the federal court. But yes, they've led to the resignation okay, of how about in Cahill. This, in this case, how many bar complaints have you filed in this case? I filed against you, Pankowski, um, Tesher, and Spolino. Why Pankowski? Uh, Pankowski because he uh, basically violated bar codes. I put it in my complaint. Okay. I think you've 
you've sued every member of the Florida Supreme Court? No. You didn't file a lawsuit against only who did you file the lawsuit against? I believe Jorge Labarga, but that was prior to him being a Supreme Court member. Okay. I might have filed against the clerk of the court, uh, Tom, I can't remember the name right now. It'll dawn on me. Uh, you didn't sue every member of the Florida Supreme Court? I might have. I, okay. it, You've depending. sued judges in New York? I have. Have you spoken to Lisa or Jill to find out their view on what you're doing and whether it's helpful or hurtful or productive? Asked and answered. What was the answer? Asked and answered. Go to that I never answered. I never asked that question. You asked me that question. No, I asked if you spoke to Lisa and Jill. I never asked if you, you spoke. You asked if I, they approved of what I was doing. I asked and answered. Go back on the record if you want. You ever spoken to David Simon about the case? or? your view of what you're doing in the case? No. You were spoken to Pam Simon about it? No. Do you feel that, any, that anyone unduly influenced your father to sign his 2012 documents? Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, it's sort of two questions. You, you, I, well, hey, I don't think he them? signed them. Okay. Right, you're characterizing again. Right, exactly. You don't think he signed them, but if he did sign them, it was as a result of undue influence. Absolutely. On Pam's behalf. No, and Ted. Okay, Pam and Ted. And Lisa and Jill, who were corralled into it, I believe, under false pretenses. Was your father someone who was easily influenced? Uh, he was very, uh, no. I wouldn't say under normal circumstances he was, but anybody whose grandchildren are being used as hostage is just a mortal man, whether he's a great warrior or a solid guy, whatever. That kind of pressure by your children is disgusting, despicable, and yes, that could break even a normally solid guy. And I think you said he was half out of his mind uh, 48 yeah. days before he died? Correct. Why was he half out of his mind? Well, I'd just taken him for a brain scan around that time. Uh, he was having severe headaches. Uh, he might have been poisoned, according to my brother, so that poisoning might have been taking place around that time. Remember, my brother contacted Palm Beach Sheriff the day he died and said his girlfriend poisoned him, so I don't know how long the poisoning might have taken place. Um, he was having screaming headaches. His legs were swollen. He was having all kinds of problems. His prednisone was being adjusted. Up and down, he was standing on his bed hallucinating uh, talking to his mother um, and basically was uh, not in the right frame of mind. When was this? Weeks before he died. How many weeks? Hmm, last two, three months. Two or three months? Yeah. So in May, during this May call, he was under the same... No, he was under issue. different. He, was, he started going back to therapy, I believe, around that for that for the stress and duress of that. But the 48 days before he died, he was suffering major meltdown physically that nobody could explain. We were taking him to a bunch of doctors. I've been trying to get the doctor's reports and have the fiduciaries do that, but they're hiding those too. It's just unbelievable. Who was taking him to the doctor? Uh, me, Rachel Walker, Diana Banks, other people. My wife, uh, we went to a series of doctors. I put him in the first petition, most of the ones we know of. Now, as trustee of the, of the Shirley Trust, uh, do you recall Ted? As alleged trustee? Do you recall Ted being in court recently trying to work with you at the court to make interim distributions for your children to go to school? No. You were calling them interim distributions. The court said, that they weren't interest distributions. See, again, yeah, I do recall Ted trying to do that the other day, make interim distributions to my children. I remember you drafting language that was going to do that, and that would have been the same fraud he committed when he took interim distributions to improper parties. Do you recall us having a hearing and sitting in the hallway for a couple of hours working on an agreement and going back before the judge and the judge reading it word for word and having you agree that you understood it and had listened to it? Uh, partially. I remember going out in the hall and you being gone for most of the time looking for documents, you coming back and writing things on pieces of paper, having half of it on an iPad screen that none of us could see, nobody had any copies, you read into the record, and I recall that the judge said 
the record will stand as to what we discussed if an agreement couldn't be signed. Okay. And the reason you didn't go for that is because you didn't like them being characterized as interim distributions? No, not just that. You would left open-ended liability statements trying to buy you and Ted waivers from all liabilities and lawsuits, and you weren't representing the interests of the children or the grandchildren, as you claim, or any of the beneficiaries. Would you agree? You were hell-bent on getting it yourself a waiver. I, you were jumping up and down thinking you had got it. And then when I asked you to change it to normal language like was discussed in the hearing, you refused, said you were going to go to the judge without my signature on the document, pay the school, and you never did. And then my kids got kicked out of school because of it. More breach of fiduciary duty, Alan. More illegal do you agree that you did malpractice sign? on your part? You know you're being sued for malpractice, do you agree, correct? Do you agree that you did not sign the agreement that was prepared after the hearing? I am aware of that. Okay, you agree you did not sign the agreement? I am aware of that. Okay, if you'd signed the agreement, the money would have been paid to the school? No, that's the money could have been paid to the school either way. You said I, you didn't need my signature. You were taking it to the judge to get the money and pay it. You blew that date. The first day of school came, my children were turned away that day because you failed. You and your client, another major breach. Where do your kids go to school now? Uh, Spanish River and Omni. Okay. At now. the great disgust of my parents. And at your great expense soon. Okay. Now. You'll be paying for their Harvard education off your malpractice policy for this. If not serving in prison for the rest of your involvement here. I'm the wrong boy like the other guys. You must have a real commitment to this case. When you signed that waiver form, even with your limiting language, was anybody present with you? Yeah, I believe my wife. Okay. Was any was any of the other beneficiaries present with you? No. Did anyone threaten you that it or there would be adverse consequences if you didn't sign the waiver form? What does this have to do with the qualifications of Ted Bernstein as a fiduciary that's going to be heard on the 14th? Huh? We've been through this waiver, but what do you want to know? Did anybody threaten me? Right. No. Did your father was, threaten you? No, I was under the threat of my father possibly dying from the stress he was under. your hope if the court removes Ted what's your hope that a successor would do I'm not speculating okay. well, what, what do you I assume you'd want the successor to do everything that Ted hasn't done uh, I would expect the successor to follow the law the okay. trust codes in the state codes. and do a forensic analysis of every piece of paper and correct. every trust document correct regardless of how much it costs correct okay well because we're going to be billing it to the parties responsible for driving those costs we wouldn't have to inspect documents for fraud if the fiduciaries and ted's lawyers didn't commit frauds already that's really not so true though, because you were investigating frauds before you knew there were any frauds you were investigating frauds from the day your father died I what I don't, that's your statement, not mine. Well, when did you start investigating and hiring a lawyer to investigate and demand to see a bunch of documents? When the documents that were legally due to me and my family were denied. And when was that? A few, maybe two, three months after September. Somewhere in this November, December or so, I believe. Of 2012, after your father died? Correct. Okay. And because you didn't see the documents, you assumed that they must be fraudulent and No, I didn't. Because they were being refused and denied, I got counsel to find out what was going on. And then she got frustrated. <laughs> and she sent in letters that I have to put into the court record that say the attorneys, her and Mark Garber, conversed about what was going on. They said the attorney should be reported to the bar and the authorities. How'd your mother what die? What they were doing. How did your mother die? Uh, I believe a... Uh, nodule in her lung of aspergillus exploded. And was she murdered or that was natural causes? 
who said she was murdered? I asked you. If my mother was murdered? Yeah. I haven't made any allegations of that. Okay. But you believe your father was murdered? I, I'm not the one who made that allegation. No, but I'm going to ask you who made the allegation. I'm asking you, do you believe your father was murdered, yes or no? I already asked and answered. Okay. What was your answer? I'm not going to read the record. Are you familiar with the Elliot Bernstein Family Trust dated May 20, 2008? I'm familiar with a document that alleges to be that. Okay. How much money was put into that trust, do you know? Nobody knows anything since all the accountings and records of the trust corp reses and corpuses of the estates are missing. It's kind of like being in a black hole instead of transparent if you had normal trustees and lawyers in there, not criminals doing criminal things because then it's hard to see anything. So we don't know anything, do we, Alan, at this point? You'd think. But you never know, smart, I was a smart guy. He could have dropped documents all over town. Why, why do you want to sue Judge Cohen? What did he do? I didn't ever want to sue him. I listed him as a material and fact witness because in the September 13th hearing, he stated my father came into his chambers to close the estate. Now, my father was dead at that time that he stated that, which if you read the hearing, that's when he said, oh my God, I'm going to read you your Mirandas to these guys, or I've got enough to read you your Mirandas. And uh, so I would be asking him questions fundamental to that. I don't believe I've sued him yet. Yet. Doesn't mean I won't. Have you sent stuff? If I personally? find information that leads me to believe that he's involved in anything that had to do with the frauds, forgeries, or anything. If he rules against you, that would that would that lead you to believe he was engaged in the frauds? No, of course okay. not. Have you sent stuff to Crystal Talks about Judge Colon? Yeah, I might have. Do you care what she writes about him? No. I love what she writes about you. Are we almost done here? Yeah, we're almost done. Oh, good. Thank God. Are you going to ever ask a question about the qualifications of Ted for the hearing? Or was this whole thing just a fishing expedition? So, you asked me a lot of questions about me. Nothing to do with the qualifications of Ted. Well, one thing, I think. Did you work at Gunster Yokely, Alan? Can you answer that question? I think it's relevant to this. Alan, did you work at Gunster Yokely? Okay, let the record reflect he won't answer if he was prior employed at Gunster Yokely. Personal between you and Ted? What personal? This the whole estate thing. Is it is it a personal battle between you and Ted? No, I think it's a personal battle of Ted's against the beneficiaries of the estates. Meaning Ted was cut out and he's been raging and upset about it, pressuring my dad. Might have you know, I don't know yet, but the more we're learning about what happened here. And if Cy was murdered and poisoned, and I don't know if you saw the recent coroner's report where there's poisons elevated in the thing, I think arsenic is three times the reportable level. Uh, there's also cadmium, which is, I think, what the Russians use to poison, yeah, uh, which is elevated and other things. But yeah, as, as we get into this, I, it, it seems that Ted is so disgruntled that he might have done some real bad acts here with his sister Pam. What makes you believe Ted was upset to be not a beneficiary 
of his parents' will and trust? Well, my father, the meeting on May 10th where we learned that he was, you know, waging war against my father and holding his children and himself and thought it was unfair and he was all these things and said that my dad and me were dead. In fact, he said my entire family is dead except for me and my wife. I put it in his petition one, exhibit one. You can read his own language where he says his father is dead while he's alive and I believe right around uh, the holidays, the first holiday my mom was dead through, which really hurt my dad even more, but you know, again, that's, uh, I believe, Ted's battle against everybody. Why are none of the other beneficiaries taking the actions that you're taking? Well, I don't know. It looks like Lisa and Jill were first siding with Ted, but I see that they're not now. Okay. What if what if Lisa and have Lisa and Ted moved to remove? Have Lisa and Jill moved? I to think they're kind of trying to stay neutral Ted. right now for a minute while they try to sort out. At first, they didn't know which side to go along with. They became a little bit more convinced of what was going on when they found out their names were fraudged and fraudulent. And I think they're learning more right now about the possible murder of my father. I believe they've got the coroner report. I put it in the court record, so you should all have copies of it. Um, you know, I don't know. I haven't been talking to them that much lately. They seem to want to remain independent. coroner concluded your father died of a heart attack, right? Uh, the coroner concluded that prior to running a heavy metals test, which he then ran after his report stating that. Meaning Ted alleged poisoning. He failed to run a poison screen. He only run a drug screen. <coughs> when I contacted him about that, and I believe Ted and his attorneys got to that coroner, they told us they were going to a private company originally, and the body went to Miami. But according to the coroner's report, that didn't happen. But so months later, when we discovered with the coroner that he hadn't run a heavy metals test, we had the coroner review the or do a heavy metals test. We got that back. There's elevated issues. I'm having it looked at. I'm trying to hire a private company right at this moment. But the coroner concluded that it was a heart attack. Right? At that time, and the coroner hasn't opened up any further investigation. Well, it's ongoing. That's why we ran the poison screening. And I'm just about to get the sheriff's coroner involved as well. We'll be seeking. Okay, no further questions. Have a good day. Okay. Well, Mr. Morrissey, I guess, do you have any questions, John?